All right, let's call this meeting to order at 7.02 p.m. We're going to start with a salute to the flag. Pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. In accordance with the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act, public meetings may be held in person or by means of communication equipment to include streaming services and other online meeting platforms. This meeting is being held in person and through the Zoom meeting platform, being broadcast from Borough Hall, 748 River Road, Ferry to New Jersey. Public participation for this regular council meeting of May 22nd, 2023 is available by call and phone number or through web conference Zoom. Members of the public will be on mute until it's time for questions or comments, which will be announced. At that time, the public has the opportunity to question or comment by phone or through Zoom by the raise hand button will be called on at the appropriate time. Notice of this meeting was included in a schedule of meetings, which was adopted by resolution number 2023-13 and sent to the Asbury Park Press, the Two River Times, and the Star Ledger on January 6, 2023, posted on the borough website, the Bolton Board and Municipal Building, and has remained continuously posted as required under the statute. With adequate notice having been given, the borough clerk is directed to include the statement in the minutes of this meeting. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Council members, Paul? Here. Bowie? Here, remotely. Uh, La Barbera? Here. No? Rodriguez. Okay. is attending by Zoom until any swivel can get here for us. Who is? Christy Melma. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are going to start with a presentation. Uh, Michael Gianforte from Two Rivers Water Reclamation Authority. Thank you for joining us. Sure, thank, thank you, Mayor there. Council. I appreciate it. And I know uh, time is important, so I'll keep it quick and just there will be plenty of time for questions. So, the reason I just want to bring everybody up to date with the uh, tunnel project, and we call it the tunnel project, but it's really two components a new main pump station and a tunnel. So, during Hurricane Sandy, <laughs> We have a existing pump station 25 feet deep and there's a two foot thick concrete wall between one side of the pump station and the other side. Uh, the one side filled up, the other side filled up. We had to pump one down to get to the pumps at the bottom to fix them. And this two foot thick concrete wall bowed and cracked. So to repair that is much more expensive than building a new pump station. And we went to FEMA and they gave us $100,000 to uh, fix it. And they said that these beams keeping this wall from collapsing into this wall was adequate. So, and where is that? This is right on Highland Avenue in Mountain Beach. So, after eight years of appeals, we got $9 million from, uh, instead of $100,000 from FEMA, which worked out pretty well for us. And then the solution, well, we're here, but the solution is, and I apologize for those in the audience, but our existing ocean port in Summers Park. That's where all flow from all towns except for Seabright, Rumson, and Mount Beach. They all come together at this point, and the existing pipe travels across here to that pump station I talked about right in Mount Beach, and that pumps it up into the treatment plant. That's right now our treatment plant. So this pipe, we it's our most critical asset, obviously, because it carries a, a nine of our towns flow. And ultimately, when we inspected this, it settled when it was originally installed in 1967. And since then, the settlement's gotten a little bit worse. The corrosion inside has gotten worse, even though we've been treating it. So failure of this pipe will put 800 million gallons of sewage into the river before we have a chance to run a bypass across an open navigable water channel. So that's the reason for this pipe replacement. As you're right with that number. Quantity, um, volume, time. It's our normal flow times the uh, time it takes to, to mobilize and get a bypass pump, bypass pumping system here, and then float, float pipes across the bay. And can you put it in like uh, some type of more simpler terms? What, what would that equal? So, well, we pump, uh, if it took a full year, which it won't, uh, we pump 4.4 billion gallons of sewage a year. So, Order of magnitude, you fill up a lot of swimming pools or a couple of stadiums before, uh, and that's just raw sewage coming in. So 
that would be a that would be horrible. So our plan is to replace this pipe and this pump station with a pump station that's above the flood elevation, right here on our ball field um, in the corner of our property. But when that, we went to design, that, you said above the flood plate. So in Sandy, so this is much this is much higher. We were under underwater completely, but this new pump station was will, not. And that's fine. On, it's on higher ground already, and then it will be elevated above uh, where we need to be. The challenge is when we went to design it, we found that the, uh, the reason it settled back in 1967 was there's this prehistoric dip of black mayonnaise. So when they laid the original pipe, it settled in this material, and it's 25 feet deep. So you can see right around here is where the pipe would lays now. So there's a couple different techniques. There's micro tunneling, there's tunnel boring. So we chose the tunnel boring machine, but we're gonna drop a uh, shaft in at the main pump station, uh, about hundred feet deep. And then we're gonna tunnel an eight foot diameter tunnel all the way across Pleasure Bay. It's better to see it up here. But we have to go underneath that soft soil. That's the only way it's going to be safe. It's still, you know, there's still a risk with having 12 guys underground for six months under a tidal water body. Mm -hmm. But we did a few hundred uh, boring samples, and the problem with doing more borings gives you more safety. Mm -hmm. But then all those borings have to be filled completely with uh, impenetrable, impenetrable gravel, or else when the guys are tunneling, they hit one of those boring shafts, it'll just bring the whole tide in on top of them. So. It's still a risky project, but from our standpoint, we took the most uh, conservative approach. Um, so that's the design. We'll have a little bend in it because you can bend a tunnel boring machine. Uh, in your handout, you'll see there's a picture of one of those tunnel boring machines. So you're welcome to come out and see it. We went to see one of the ones that was done by a similar company down underneath Dulles Airport. But again, it's a, I, people always say, you know, can we come and walk through the tunnel? Conceivably, there's some releases you have to sign, but it is scary in that tunnel because there's always water dripping in. It's only eight feet high. There's a railroad track for the debris to get out, you know, and it's, it's hauling stuff out. So uh, we went out to bid, and the bids came in. The engineer's estimate was originally $70 million, but with the economy changing and there's too much infrastructure money out there, uh, the bids came in at $111 million, so we rejected them. And then we did a lot of research. We interviewed all of the seven pre-qualified bidders and found that that was actually a low bid. So we went back out for bid again, and it turned out to be 111, 180, I think it is. So that's the price. So I went to try to find some money with, from the federal government. We worked with uh, Frank Colon a little bit. The ultimate result was I got a $20 million grant in addition to the $9 million we got for Sandy uh, through COVID money. As you know, there's COVID money sitting there, and some towns aren't using all their allotment. So we were able to snag 20 million. We ultimately added to that a million dollars to pay me and anybody else in our administration that works on the grant. So there's an extra million dollars to cover our salaries and to cover some of the engineering costs to administer the grant. So that's the story. So the impact to you, obviously, as we talked about earlier, um, we don't. Fairhaven doesn't ever write us a check except for uh, your services, just like another resident. It's we're made up, and I should have started with this, but we're made up of six member towns. You're a member town, you have representation on our board and well represented. And uh, we have six customer towns. Customer towns write me a check for the entire town. The member towns, the individuals write the check. So we're owned by the individuals, not by the towns. So an authority is made up of rate payers. So, uh, as I think most of you know, we haven't raised the rate since I've been there. We haven't raised the rates in 22 years. It's the only one in New Jersey that I know about has mm -hmm. raised, raised the rates since 2001. Uh, this will cause us probably to go up uh, $10 a quarter in, next year. And that should buy us 10 years of no rate increases if we can continue to cut costs and do it efficiently. Then we'll be able to go further than that. That's the impact of the project. That's the project. But any questions on the authority? I know I haven't. When will the project start? <clears throat> so we the notice received was May 15th. And just so I could cheat, it'll be done in three years. The other advantage that we did was we're able to move the first payment to the contractor will come right at the first month of the state's fiscal year. 
So we'll get three years of zero interest loans on the $111 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. So we won't be paying any or accruing any interest during that time period. I shouldn't say that. It's about $49 a month for the uh, some minor administrative costs. So it's about zero interest for the $111 million. Dollars. That'll buy us a little bit of time because we still um, are able to build a little bit of a surplus for the member towns, and that'll help get us the 10 years once we raise the rates next year. And that's just my anticipation. It's something to recommend to our board, but it's a board decision for rates. Can you go to the uh, bigger? Um, sure. Board. <clears throat> um, one more. Can you talk through a little bit of like the one more? If you come on. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Can you talk through a little bit of kind of the, the risk management? Sure. Right. So I'm specifically focused on two components, right? Yeah. If there was a failure, right? What risk management processes and protocols are you putting in place, specific to mobilization, preventing, you know, impact to the surrounding areas, obviously the sewage coming in. Can you just talk about what you have how you guys approach that? Sure. So we set up a uh, a bypass net. we put a temporary bypass system in at the existing main pump station. So if there's a failure of the pumps, we can drop suction in the uh, manhole out here. So we can drop the suction there and pump up to the treatment plant on the ground. If there's a failure of this pleasure bay, there's a way to run, we can connect in here and have that, the pump station itself do the pumping. It's just a matter of laying the pipes. The problem is getting them to fuse the HDPE pipe that you have to lay across the bay. Nobody's gonna stockpile it just in case, nobody's gonna do any of that stuff. We have the sizing of the pumps uh, and we have all the special fittings that are needed over here. So in the event it does fail, we have all the special fittings in place. It's actually a, like a manifold of all the pumps that will be needed. I mean, picture tractor trailer size pumps that are needed. So if it does fail and the parts <clears throat> aren't on ready supply, right, to fix right. the pipe, what do you do with the current wall sewage from the towns of Pummelin? No, what, or if we talk about the way it would normally fail, it would pr probably fail with a little bit of increased flow into the pipe, and then it would get worse and worse. So hopefully during that time period, you're just taking it in, pumping it up into the treatment plant and treating it. Yeah. So the treatment plant has enough capacity to handle some increased I and I or infiltration inflow. And as you know, during that storm in the end of April, we took a lot of flow. And I, I gotta say, Fairhaven was one of the towns where uh, we identified a lot of clean flow, so people are putting their sump pumps into the, and we sent out a newsletter, and uh, it appeared, in, or it's going to appear in your uh, newsletter. But we can handle the, the extra flow, but if we had this failure and a storm like the April storm at the same time, that would be a real problem. And how does insurance work? Like, how are you positioning yourselves from an insurance perspective, given the risk factors? So... Uh, you know, we are members of the joint insurance fund. So the joint insurance fund, we have back, we have a base layer and then we have excess. The excess, I don't know exactly how that would come out with the excess, but we have all the insurance that's required in our one uh, bond adventure and, a, and all current bond adventures. So the insurance is in place, but I, the most important thing is we got to get over with the project. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Um, and again, this is a gravity sewer going under here. So it's got air in the top of it. So if something leaks, it'll leak in, not out until everything goes wrong. And then that's a catastrophic, catastrophic failure. Yep. We should have time before a catastrophic failure, but we do have the infiltration, you know, starting at this time. Okay. That's why we're on it. Uh, the, the members of each community are on the board. Are they compensated out of that million dollars or is that for other compensation? No. So no, you're one of only, I think, two sewer authorities in the state of New Jersey that don't have compensated board members. So it's Roosevelt, who I used to be the consulting engineer for 30 years ago before I started here, and two rivers. So it works out very well politically, politically because I see some of these other towns that have not only pay their commissioners, but then they have health insurance, mm -hmm. and that gets to be a sticky situation. And again, I can't say it enough. I mean, I appreciate we have some challenging, I've had some challenging board members in my 30 years there, and Fairhaven at least is extremely cooperative and knowledgeable, so it's very helpful. Thank you.
Um, one question, sure. if I may. Um, after you deduct all the, the grants that we were able to secure, thank you. What's the net cost of the project? So uh, I'm not exactly sure, but okay. we expect a bond for like 110. Believe it or not, that's because there's uh, the engineering design and construction observation is about five million dollars. <throat> the uh, DEP takes a three million dollar fee out of it. Mm -hmm. You can tell I'm really mm -hmm. eager to write that check. <laughs> Um, but there's other million dollar checks that just add up and it's eaten away that, uh, that grant, the grants. My last question is by going um, as deep as this plan is, do, do we, is there a long-term benefit in terms of maintenance or do we have to buy special equipment to get down there and take care of it? So it's, I mean, it's, uh, it didn't bring, it's a concrete cylinder that, that uh, goes in the ground. It's a, somewhere around 100 feet in diameter and mm -hmm. there'll be an elevator in there to get down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's tough for a guy, especially some of the older guys that mm -hmm. have to climb all the way down and check things out. But um, no, the, the, there'll be increased costs because once the sewage gets down there, then you got to pump it back up mm -hmm. and that there's an increased electric cost for that. But being down in that mud will probably prevent you from needing another one of these. Oh, um, the expected life on RCP, PCCP or PCP pipe is somewhere around 40 to 50 years. The uh, pipe we're putting in here is a Kobas, a woven fiberglass uh, pipe that has a 100 year warranty. So. Okay. My last question is, Mayor, with the, with the engineer and the pre-qualification of bidders, can you just talk a little bit about how you <coughs> chose them based on the experience level that they had? Sure, so what we did was pre-qualified um, the one general, and then they were tied to a tunneler. So, uh, we went through the whole process, had to go through, I had to testify with the DCA to allow us to do this special process of pre-qualification in the state of New Jersey. And uh, ultimately, it was criteria for the superintendents and the staff that would be involved. There was criteria for the number of pump stations they've done of similar, also similar size, same thing on the tunnels. And again, the, with a project like this, all the little scary guys dropped out. Um, mm -hmm. And the people that we have are really good. The problem is, like I said, when we went out to bid, we had seven pre-qualified <clears throat> bidders. Only two bid on the job because, for example, uh, Skanska, who was really, I mean, they, they probably spent $200,000 on their bid preparation. But then they dropped out at the end because they got a billion-dollar job on JFK, at JFK. Uh, Railroad dropped out because they got another billion-dollar job. All the, you know. They don't want to do a little hundred million dollar job, but there's these million dollar jobs that uh, our current administration's handling. Super helpful. Thank you. I'm good as <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thank That's you. And, and if you want an update or you want something else, I'll give you written updates, but I'll be great to come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is on your website. It is. So if you go on the main page, there's a tunnel banner. Just hit the back. All right, uh, moving along, workshop stormwater management. Nick Borchinski is here. He's going to talk about uh, our stormwater management general permit. Um, he has a consulting engineer's proposal from Le Leon Avakian, as well as uh, StormX and stormwater system operations. And Mayor Rich is going to do a, a, a slight intro. Yes, they're, they're chatting. Oh, we, we love that. Good evening. <laughs> Um, on the workshop agenda, we're here to talk about the stormwater management rules. And Nick from my office, uh, he's been with us over 10 years now. He is going to give an overview. He's got a PowerPoint presentation to walk you through about a 10,000 feet overview of the rules. Um, Stormwater rules came into effect in 2004. So we, as engineers, we've been dealing with, we've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And he's gonna talk about tier A, tier B, water quality, water quality, all these buzz terms you're used to, impervious coverage, impervious surface, uh, what's classified as major development, the new rules that just came online this year, how it affects the state all the way down to the local level, what it means for the borough of Fairhaven, what we're mandated to do, what we do every year, what these new rules um, 
as a tier A permit municipality what we're required to do. And Mayor, as you mentioned, uh, we did get a proposal from our consulting engineer. This is one of these tasks that we need some help. We need some assistance. We reached out to them back in April. They submitted a proposal that basically outlines um, their fee structure, the various phases of what's required for the permit mandates. And um, it was dated April 10th. I think some of that again in the packets. Mm -hmm. We can jump into that later at the end if you want. There is a slide on that, but I'm going to turn it over right now. Um, we're going to throw up on a PowerPoint. It is quite lengthy, just so you know. So, Drew, you got your competition tonight. 15 to 22 minutes. <laughs> hey, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, stormwater is interesting. It's it's uh, it's one of those things where it goes unseen. Um, but it impacts everybody's daily life tremendously. Um, everybody gets their sanitary sewer bills, they get their cable bills, they get their electric bills, but nobody gets a stormwater bill. And it's something that's, uh, that, that impacts us, but we don't necessarily kind of understand it or really see how it impacts us. So I'm gonna to try to tie all that into the, the regulations to Fairhaven and um, what we need to do and what we're doing. Okay, next slide. So again, the, the agenda is to talk about the federal and state stormwater regulations and give you an update on the MSO permit and our renewal and the details on the DEP grants and the, and the funding sources. Next slide. So stormwater, like I said, it impacts everything. It, we're, we're dealing with flooding, we're dealing with safety risks, but we're also dealing with uh, recreational purposes. We use the, the Navasink River for, for boating, for fishing, for <coughs> also biological and wildlife resources. People go bird watching or just enjoying, the, or enjoying themselves along the river. Um, so again, I'm gonna try to talk about who, what, where, and how of stormwater. Next slide. Um, here I can't see behind the column, but uh, yeah, so stormwater. New Jersey is one of the most aggressive stormwater programs in the, in the, in the country. Um, and Fairhaven has, uh, like every other municipality, a role of, of dealing with stormwater management. And then as elected officials and employees and, and volunteers, you know, we're tasked with protecting the state's natural environment. Uh, it's complex, but hopefully today I can give an overview of some of the obligations that we have. Next slide. So this, this, this picture kind of encapsulates stormwater. We have rules and we have rules and we have rules on top of rules. Um, and, and each of them is, is kind of overlapping, but yet important. So Rich and I, that's what we feel like sometimes sitting yeah. there underneath the clouds. <laughs> So how did the stormwater rules come into fruition? So basically in 1970, the EPA uh, was created and the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. Then soon after in, in 1972, um, you know, we had the clean, what's considered the Clean Water Act where the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System was, uh, was codified. And that basically gave the states the ability to implement the stormwater program. So in 1982, we had federal authorization and New Jersey created the first round of what's called the NGIPTES, the New Jersey Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. And then right after that, the federal government uh, in 1987 created the Clean Water Act or the Water Quality Act of phase one and phase two, which gave some more details of how stormwater needs to be managed. Um, and the phase two of the, U of the EPA rules is what Rich had uh, alluded to, um, was what created the 2004 MS MS4 program for, for stormwater management. Next slide. So everybody always asks, what does MS4 stand for? So it stands for municipal separate storm sewer systems. So it's different than, uh, 
for instance, a combined sewer where sanitary and stormwater are combined and treated. MS4 is just for stormwater itself. <clears throat> Next slide. So who, who kind of um, administers, administers the water quality regulation? It's the, for us, it's the DEP as the Bureau of the Watershed Protection and Restoration through the, um, the Najipti Stormwater Permitting Program. And, and what it does is it is controls um, or regulates stormwater discharges into our, into our water bodies. Next slide. So when did this come into play? So MS4 permit was the, was the legal framework that was established. And how does this kind of, on the grand scheme and layman's terms, has, has Fairhaven fit into this? Fairhaven is basically given a permit from the state which is given a permit from the federal government to discharge water into the Navasink River or, or coastal communities. So each of us is part of that permit. So we're an oper a licensed operator to discharge. And that's what that MS4 permit really means. Um, and that means that myself, Rich, you as elected officials, the volunteers, the environmental commission, all of those, different groups have responsibility when you're looking at ordinances, when you're looking at capital improvement projects, when you're looking at whatever, you need to make sure that the stormwater rules are being considered and uh, that you're taking into consideration and actually implementing what, the, what, our, what our permit requires. So the first permit we received was in 2004. And then again, we, there was a renewal process in 2009, 2018, and then now in 2023. Nick, real quick, why? Like, why? Why go with the MS4 permit? What are? No, maybe. It, it's 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 basically required by the by the by the federal government to and discharge into the. So, so we're giving a permit, a license to to discharge. If we weren't given that permit, we basically couldn't put our water into the Navasink River or anything. Correct. Right. That's what I'm just, I'm just curious. So, so there was a decision point. I'm assuming in 2004 that. We didn't have it goes back to 19, that's why I was trying to give you the legal framework back to, to, to 1970 with the Clean Water Act. It, it ties all the way back to there. No, I understand. My, my question is, is, is what is the alternative to that? What is the alternative to discharging water into the Navasink? There, no, there is no alternative. Okay. That's, yeah. Let's try it out. Okay. Yeah. Well, just from a, what if we didn't have the Navasink? Where would we discharge the water? Well, the that's what the DEP is starting to. to to think about is that stormwater management is just is not just a municipal kind of boundary issue. It's more of a watershed basis. And that's one of the changes that they made in the permit process for the 2023. They're going on a watershed um, analysis and, and basis for, for approving permits. So everybody that's in a specific watershed has responsibility. So you can't just say that, okay, Red Bank, you're not in in Fairhaven, you can discharge through through Shrankers Pond into the Navasink. Um, they're looking at it from the entire, you know, what they call the Huck 11 or Huck 14 kind of <coughs> watershed area. Uh, next slide. So again, what is the MS4 program and, and how is it implemented? It basically talks about how we address stormwater is either in quality or quantity. So quality, obviously, everybody knows what quality is, the quality of the water, and then quantity is the volume associated with it. And it's related to how we do our daily operations of public works, any type of new development that goes on or redevelopment. And also, you know, regarding our existing developed areas, Fairhaven is kind of unique because we're pretty much a residential area with a small business corridor. But these rules kind of apply to you know, everyone in Middlesex County, Bergen County, you know, Cumberland County, the Highlands is totally different. They have a whole new set of uh, structures with regard to water and aquifers with the Highlands Act. Um, and the same thing with the Pinelands. Those are two different distinct areas in New Jersey that have additional regulations besides the DEP regulations of the MSF, MS4 program. Uh, next slide. Again, I tried to quickly the, the black is the is the is the federal and then the blue is kind of uh, you know the the DP um, kind of highlights and the permit basically requires you know six minimum or six basic requirements and it involves public involvement local public education um, regulating construction activity runoff 
um, post construction management of the storm water, pollution prevention, and then alcohol and pipe mapping, <clears throat> illicit discharge, scouring, detection, and control. Um, the, 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 the construction activity, stormwater runoff that's associated with this, um, is, is geared more for, for larger projects, large subdivisions, 100, 200 lot subdivisions, and things like that. We really don't have those types of projects in Fairhaven, but obviously, if we did, we would have to get just two other additional permits there. Uh, what comes into play in the Fairhaven is more of the freehold soil conservation district and you know implementing soil erosion measures. Uh, next slide. And everybody knows that development, you know, there's two basically issues with development. There's you know a type and quantity of pollutants that are that are introduced or, or increased with development. There's also an increased um, you know volume of quantity of water that's discharged during during development standards. Um, and what are the solutions and, and how do we propose or how do we manage or mitigate those things? Um, the, the MS4 permit requires us to have these four elements and, and Fairhaven has it. It's a stormwater pollution prevention plan, stormwater management plans, our annual reports and our ordinances. And um, you know, these are all on our website. And you know, as we move forward with the renewal, they will be updated and kind of coordinated. Um, now I'll kind of go into some more details of those, those four things, those four uh, uh, you know, parts of the MS4 permit that are required. Next slide. You know, the stormwater pollution prevention plan has, you know, like 15 or 16 specific uh, attachments that are required. And the, the 2023 permit kind of elaborates on that and has a specific timeline associated with it. So each one of the, I'll go through some of these issues on the next slide. So again, public involvement and participation. Um, you know, how, how does Fairhaven uh, work through that? So anytime we have a, a planning board meeting or a zoning board meeting, then applicant is, is working on a project for development, they have to do public notices. And that's how we could kind of accomplish some of that as part of the uh, requirement for the MS4. Next slide. Again, our stormwater management page, uh, has all the elements of the actual permit that has all those other elements. The two highlighted sections are some of the new things that are required, the infrastructure mapping, and then also the, the watershed improvement plan, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So next slide. Again, local public education and outreach. Um, we do that through our website and also through communications, the Daily Buzz, you know, Betty Ann helps us with uh, our stormwater management kind of uh, notes that we blast out, uh, brush and leaf schedules, uh, street sweeping stuff. These are all the things, the, the basic thing, the common sense things that we, that we do on a, on a yearly basis. Next slide. Again, construction site stormwater runoff. Um, there's certain triggers and criteria for this. It usually doesn't, it hasn't come up and probably won't come up for, for Fairhaven, but it's out there as part of the, the permit as well. Next slide. 5G, 5G3. That's another, it's a, it's a permit. That's correct. 5G3. Similar to MS4. Say again. Similar to MS4. It's a, it's, it has to do just with construction. Check. Yeah. Next slide. Um, so this is just the post-construction stormwater management for, for new development. There's a whole set of rules and training that's required of the, of the volunteers and the people reviewing it from a planning board engineer to the, the volunteers um, that when they review an application, they have to make sure that it meets the current uh, DP regulations. Next slide. Community-wide ordinances, Fairhaven ordinances include, you know, pet waste, uh, wildlife feeding, litter control, improper disposal of waste, yard waste, private storm drain inlet retrofitting. Um, we just heard from Two Rivers regarding, you know, illegal um, sump pumps tied into our, our <clears throat> sanitary system. There's also uh, people tying in sump systems into our stormwater systems. Um, be a, either it could be a discharge from a washing machine or, or who knows what. And these are things that from a public work standpoint, um, you know, we, we kind of, uh, take a take a look at when our we do our annual stream corridor walks and things like that. One of the new ordinances that we're going to have to develop is for private salt storage. So if an Acme or uh, or, or a business in town has a board of education has salt piles, uh, that that's no longer allowed to have just a parking lot 
with salt on it, with a tarp on it, because that obviously if it rains, it runs off into our stormwater system and it affects our, our water body. Next slide. Uh, street sweeping. Obviously, we Fairhaven purchased uh, a street sweeper, and we are currently, you know, working on various different DPW operations after uh, brush and leaf pickup, or during our summertime time when we have uh, the street sweeper also has a has a vacuum cleaner, basically, or a sewer vac that we can clean out our our, our inlets. Uh, and we're constantly, you know, working to develop and maintain our, our compliance with this part of the SPPP, the Stormwater Prevention Plan. Next slide. Large part of our stormwater conveyance system is our storm inlets. Um, our inlets have to be labeled, they have to be retrofitted to be bicycle safe grades. Um, you know, there's all the different requirements. So when we do an engineering project, we're doing a capital improvement project. We make sure that we also incorporate, uh, you know, retrofitting and upgrading the inlets and grates so that, um, you know, floatables and various other things are not collected and being discharged into Navisink. How many total inlets and what percent still require retrofitting? You know, there's okay. there's like 250. I think it's like 350. Um, and uh, you oh. know, our, ballpark maybe five to ten percent are still some of the old ones old castings and stuff that we have to kind of retrofit some of them are hard to get because they're so old and there's special sizes associated with them the eight inch heads or they're they're narrower than the stir the standard type of, of of campbell inlet but we've been working through that on a on a ongoing basis to, to retrofit them. Um, and also if a utility company comes in um, doing a project we work with them to also have them uh, upgrade the inlets. It's kind of a uh, twisting your arm type of effort, but we, we're trying to get them to also help us out in, in the locations where they're doing utility work. And we, just to add, we get audited. So we get mm -hmm. we get inspections and they ask us what roads have you paved and they will go out and check. DEP? Is that, yeah, is that correct. Body? correct. Next slide. And one of the requirements is, is kind of herbicide application management. Um, this doesn't necessarily come from the public work standpoint from Fairhaven, but the Monmouth County does do some, some roadside applications or, or has that on, on their scale, um, but it's, in, it's part of our permit as well. So it's something we have to consider. Next slide. The icing material management. Uh, we got lucky this year, we didn't have many storms, but, but generally speaking, if our public works you know, stops at a stop bar or a stop sign or something and salt kind of cascades out. One of the new aspects of the permit is to make sure that within 72 hours, we have to go and clean up the, the, the debris, the piles of, of salt that are out there. So it's not just Fairhaven, this is across the state. You know, you'll see that after storms, there's uh, a post-mortem to go out and actually do some, you know, cleanups and stuff. Has that been an issue for us or no? We, we've kind of, um, internally have had that as, as a policy so it's not going to be a big deal but it, it happens you know it, it does happen it's, it's equipment you have mechanical failures or what have you and we need to deal with it uh, next slide uh, roadside vegetative waste management uh, obviously Fairhaven does uh, brush and leaf collection um, throughout the throughout the year different seasons and different schedule um, stormwater management permit has specific uh, requirements for that as well. Obviously, uh, like we had a, a few weeks ago, uh, if there's vegetative waste or stuff in the, in the gutter, um, they create beaver dams. And these beaver dams cause flooding, um, you know, cascading the water out into the travel lane, causing unsafe conditions. So these are some of the, the issues and things that uh, the borough is working through. And vegetative waste is not brush and vegetative waste is not leaves, correct? Correct. We wanna make sure it's really, because we're going for an education on that, okay. And a lot of times it's all mixed together because that's yeah. just the way landscapers or residents and, and things have, have kind of put it together. Look, in olden times, everybody, Opened their window, threw everything out the window, it landed in the street, and then they didn't have to worry about it. And what the DEP is saying is that, look, you have to worry about it because it flows downstream and it's affecting someone else. So we need to figure out how to make 
the public aware of it and that you can't just throw everything out the window, have it in, in the street, in the gutter and, and have it flow away. I think it's like not your problem anymore. That can be disposed of in your garbage bin, correct? The vegetative waste? Um, Is it like cutting a the, top the, off the a carrot? Specific or a compost? Of, they have, comp, have on-site composting and other suggestions that, that might work for, for residents or for people, for landscapers. Uh, next slide is the roadside erosion control program. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, you know, I know my kids when they take a hose, they like to stick it in the ground or in the, in the sand and watch it make a hole. You know, the same thing happens when it rains or there's a stormwater outfall uh, that's discharging into uh, an embankment or something, it causes erosion. And what we do from a DPW standpoint is before every storm or every major storm that's kind of uh, uh, forecasted, we go out and, and check various different locations in town and make sure that they're clear and, and, and safe. And we do the same thing uh, after a storm and we work through the different issues and, and we have a list of, of problems and we kind of prioritize them and uh, and work through the through it's a, it's a it's it's a process, but we work through it in in compliance with the MS4 permit. Are there different tiers of erosion? Like, would that be like the worst tier? And well, then, it, it, obviously, be funny. yeah, obviously there's safety considerations. If, if it's, it's no different, if a sinkhole or something is created for an unknown condition, it, it causes, uh, if it's on a major road versus a local road or in the middle of the woods, there's obviously you know, criteria. There's, there's concerns and criteria. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Again, our, our drain inlets and our catch basins, uh, you know, we have less than a thousand. Um, we obviously review them on an annual basis in compliance. Is that these are some of the some of the, the aspects of the permit. Next slide. Try to kind of run through this. this is Nick, when you do the, the annual, or not you personally, but as the catchments are cleaned out, whether it's back or you have to remember right. getting there, I know sometimes things are blowing the back and sweat out. Right. Do you have to how do you document that? Is is there a photograph for each cat? Yeah, we, we have an inspection form. We have an inspection form. We take pictures. Our foreman uh, take pictures and, and email to us. We have uh, uh, folders on on the OneDrive that kind of document all the different things. That's is cool. it perfect? No. Um, the DP is is trying to, um, and you'll see in part of the, the new formats is trying to, um, I don't say mandate, but are trying to help. Uh, standardize that with regard to you know documenting, reporting, and 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 the, the big push is to make sure that those those different locations we can identify and address in in whatever fashion we need to in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, the same thing with uh, inspection of the actual the pipes between the inlets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for example, when we do a uh, an engineering project like Hans Road, we incorporate. Um, inspection and cleaning of, of, of the stormwater system so that when we when the road is completed, curb, uh, pavement, uh, drainage, we can also look into the pipes and see if there's any any concerns or issues that, that can be resolved either through the cleaning or if there's there's something else that needs to be resolved, we can plan and address it accordingly. Uh, next slide. You know, we're also tasked for, you know, with all of us is to inspect our infrastructure, um, you know, our actual stormwater basins. Um, we have one at Fair Haven Fields. We have an infiltration basin that's associated with the parking lot, uh, for example. And, you know, our guys not only drag ball fields, we're also dragging and inspecting our infiltration basins with the, with the same equipment so that, we know if, if, the, if the infiltration basin is just left there, that sand becomes compacted, caked on, and the water doesn't, isn't allowed to drain or infiltrate. It's not being, it's not doing what it's designed to do. And we're constantly reviewing that, checking our outlet control structure, and making sure that it's not clogged, that the leak debris is not preventing the water from getting into the system and operating correctly. So, you know, we're kind of lucky. We don't have a lot of uh, municipal owned uh, basins or infrastructure like that, but we do have them and we do inspect them. Next slide. And we also have ones that are privately owned, um, and we have to address those through uh, also inspection and documentation purposes. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, these are some of the kind of common sense, good housekeeping, best management practices that that the public works, and we have to do on a on a, on a daily, quarterly, seasonal basis. Um, I'm not going to go through all them, but see them there. Real quick, back up. Yeah. You don't need to go back to the slide. On the private owned 
stormwater management solutions, do they have to follow Fed and state guidelines? Yes. That's my first question. Yes, depending on the size and volume and you know the way it was designed. Yes. So in other words, like a, a private residential system, a dry well. You know, obviously the the resident is responsible for making sure that it's operating and you know taking making sure that it's it's working. Obviously, if you see that the the water is not going in and it's it's flowing out of your downspout, flooding downstream, you know you need to address it. And it's the same thing with a, a larger system. Second, the costs incurred from inspection does are there costs associated that the town charges, or is it? Just part of the role and responsibility of the DPW. No, it's just part of our, our annual report, but it's also part of the volunteers and the planning board, the zoning board, as you're doing the design. Got to kind of look at some of that. Helpful. Thanks. Next slide. Um, yeah, these are just some of the additional requirements for the MSF, MS4 permit. In other words, like our fuel station at DPW, we have a spill kit there in case there's a a discharge from the diesel or for the uh, or for the regular fuel there. Um, it's good housekeeping, but it's also required by our, our, our permit. Next slide. Obviously all, all the uh, um, municipal board and governing body officials are required to do their, their training. Uh, the same thing with various different boards, the engineers, you know, also DPW employees, we, uh, we do our annual training, we do refreshers, we do toolbox talks, we do tailgate type of talks regarding safety and DP, and, uh, and stormwater management. Um, and that's something that the DP is, is kind of focusing on also in the future. Next slide. So in the past, the, uh, the DP required just uh, mapping of the outfall locations. Um, now the mapping is going to the next level where they're wanting every single inlet, every single pipe identified, um, the size of the pipe location, where it flows to, what flows into it. So it's, it's a, I don't say a Herculean effort, but it, it's taking it to the next level. Especially with the watershed, that's gonna make it a little bit more challenging. Well, again, they're, they're, they're aggregating all that information. They're not requiring the, 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 the municipality to do it. And I'll show you later how they're opening into the, into the DEP ArcGIS system. Sure. So, sorry, just to understand, um, locally, are we legal? Do we have any maps right now? I'll get into that. I'll oh, show you. Okay. Yeah. Next slide. Again, this is just a uh, stream scouring. Um, a perfect example of that is at the end of range when the stormwater discharge or alcohol pipe hits, a, hits an area and scours away an existing system. Some of the old infrastructure didn't have riprap or head wall protection, and you have scouring conditions that undermine existing infrastructure. So that's something that uh, you know we're required to look at, address, and make sure uh, we meet our compliance. Next slide. Uh, illicit discharge detection, elimination, obviously uh, sump pumps, any type of uh, anything that's not really sh should it. If something shouldn't be connected to the stormwater system, it shouldn't be. And the way we kind of handle this from a public works standpoint and from the engineering standpoint is we do winter and summer stream walks and testing. So winter time when the when the there's you know time and resources and availability, we walk down the stream corridors and we can easily see pipes or things that are not being hit by vegetation or what have you. In summertime during low flow conditions, if a stream is flowing very heavily and it hasn't rained in a long time. There's a problem there because that water is coming from somewhere and we need to figure out where it's coming from and it shouldn't be. So those are some of the things that we constantly are, are, are required to do. Question on that. I've long wondered, do we have adequate ordinance? Is it is it clear enough that there are ordinances that prohibit? Yes, we follow the DEP requirements, you know, to date, but those requirements <coughs> keep changing and keep incorporating, you know, more and more. Um, you know, details and, and stringent requirements. I mean, I don't know if residents understand this. You know, it's one thing to adopt a, 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 an excellent law that makes sense. You can't, your, your runoff can't go in the street because it's going to go in the river. But a lot of residents might not understand that. And even at the time of application, whether they're before a planning board or a zoning board, I'm not even sure, you know, I'm not there for vacation, or maybe it does come up, but right. I'm not, I think that we need a little bit closer messaging 
maybe between our land use boards. I know at your office, when someone comes in, I'm sure it's part of your conversation with them, but you can't talk to everybody and it's not practical. Um, I'm just seeing a gap. Yeah, no, obviously the, the DEP has ceilings and triggers which mm -hmm. require certain requirements to be met with regard to stormwater management. Um, you know, Fairhaven sometimes a lot of the projects fall in that gap where they don't because necessarily. Because it's not big enough, you mean? Because the development's not big enough? To correct. <laughs> We could still end up with <clears throat> problems. Councilman Cole, I, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm wondering if this might be an opportunity for us to, to put some sort of one page communication together um, because I agree, residents probably are not aware. Okay. We'll reach out. Yeah, there's, there's more that we're getting into. We've also here. seen scenarios too, Trace, where the DEP guidance as a trickle down from the wooden chip. Clear one and zoning used to be the riparian. Yeah. So our ordinance. Obviously, state trumps local, right? But our right. ordinance is the old DEP guidance. So I don't know how many of those instances exist that are contributed to this to the gap that, that you're calling out. I think it's a long story. Well, uh, but fair point. I yeah. just need to know. <clears throat> Obviously, the, the this is the the part of the program that's that's new is the, the watershed improvement plan, and this kind of ties into the future of Fairhaven, the future of the watershed. Um, and honestly, uh, it's hard to kind of wrap around how that's all going to play out. These are obviously new rules and new regulations. Um, and we'll have to work with um, our consultants and with our various different groups in town to make sure that we incorporate what we want into this new improvement plan. Is there any like grant money or, or we'll support? We'll get to that. Right. Awesome. I'm specific to helping understand this. We'll get to check, check. So again, this there's different phases. Uh, is this the next slide? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so there's different phases to the improvement plan. Uh, obviously, the first is kind of identifying and, and submitting an inventory, then preparing, you know, an assessment of the actual report, and then phase three is kind of doing the, you know, the outreach and some additional stuff with regard to possible improvements or implementation of those things. So this is all in the new 2023 renewal of our MS4. Next. And again, the, the watershed improvement plan um, for Fairhaven, what does it mean? We got to do additional mapping of, of our publicly and privately owned infrastructure, the impervious coverage aspect of it. You know, we kind of were ahead of this with regard to some of our Rutgers mm -hmm. uh, help that we did in, in 2016. Um, there's a planning aspect of it. Obviously, when we do our master plan, this kind of uh, watershed improvement plan, the environmental commission have to work together and, and figure out how it's relevant uh, with the, the existing water quality data that we have and how we um, intend to, uh, you know, better that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. And again, record keeping is, is always part of the MS4 permit, and there's there's we continue to do that. Next slide. Um, the annual report and, and, and supplement the questionnaires that we do uh, is, is also an MS4 you know requirement. Next slide. Um, again, these are all the, the, the submissions. There's a lot of stuff here. I, I know it's it's a lot to comprehend, but there's it's it's not a simple. It's not a simple one-off thing. It, it's something that not just Fairhaven has to go through, but, but every municipality in, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, next slide. So obviously, the like I started <laughs> off, there's a direct connection between the federal government, the state of New Jersey, and Fairhaven. So the DEP got a master permit for the state of New Jersey. And now each individual municipality is going to have to kind of tailor their renewal for the MS4 to meet that overall general permit. And I think, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that's in your packet or not, but that it's a it's a, over 150 pages of, of regulation and stuff, stuff that I've tried to summarize, uh, but it's available. It'll be available to everybody. Next slide. And there's a, uh, a timeline, each one of those uh, rows and columns kind of correlates to the master permit and to the MS4 permit that's required from Fairhaven. Uh, next slide. 
and you know basically Fairhaven and the different entities, be it the development side, be it the operations and maintenance side, and the public works facilities, and you know through the stormwater coordinators office and the engineers office that that we have here in Fairhaven, we need to all work together so that we can accomplish this compliance. Next slide. So here's a quick screenshot of Fairhaven's website with regards to stormwater management. It has a quick blurb there, but it also has the links to all the different things that are currently in our MS4 permit. Obviously, the new things we'll have to address and update, but that's just a quick snapshot of that. Next slide. To answer the earlier question, our current mapping has the infrastructure, the inlets and piping associated with our infrastructure on maps that look like that, AutoCAD straight line diagrams. They're, you know, they met the purpose and need in the past. Uh, next slide. So when we did our outfall mapping, we, we had to submit that information to the DEP and the DEP took that information and logged it onto the, the DEP Bureau of GIS information. So each one of those dots represents a specific outfall that was designated and can be located. So the next step the DEP is requiring from the municipalities is to take all the pipes and all that, and then fill in all that information with regard to pipe size, location, you know, contributing drainage areas, point of analysis, and, and they're, they're aggregating that for the entire state to get a better understanding and, and you know, ultimately <coughs> provide uh, more protection for, for water bodies. Mm -hmm. so, next slide. And obviously, we're working with um, you know, FEMA as well with regard to our, our flood ordinance. Last year, we passed our, our you know, ordinances to meet the, 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 the DEP audit that was done. Um, and we continue to, you know, uh, kind of work congruently between the two different programs to make sure we're in compliance. Nick, real quick, are these maps on our website? Um, links are. Uh, this is a dynamic map that you can zoom in and zoom out and see the floodplain. You know, this is stuff that's we have links to, or we can make sure they're on the website. Um. So you can see Shippies Pond, Shrankers, Fourth Creek, and, and various different. Um, if I had it on my screen here and it's working, I could dynamically show you and zoom in. But these are just screenshots because it's uh, kind of a, supposed to be a quick 10 minute uh, presentation. So, so if the Environmental Commission wanted to, this has come up several times. Mm -hmm. And if they, as a commission, wanted to review this, they, we could access the links from the yeah, website. Yeah. yeah. And, and that would be on the stormwater page. Um, if if not, I'll make sure that's available or we can send it to you guys. Or... Oh, that's nice. Thanks. That makes it easier. Next slide. So, uh, Avakian was brought in as a, our consulting engineer for Fairhaven. And, and like Rich was saying, they prepared a, um, a proposal which was going to help um, our in house and our department kind of make sure that we're in compliance with the new 2023 regulations. Um, you know, I don't want to read those all, but that's basically what their proposal was stating. You have copies of it. Um, the next slide, real quick on that, right? So, <laughs> yeah. the three prepare bullets. How that is, how does that align with the triggers to get each phased on, right? So, phase one of water set was like in DPA plus 36 right. months, and it was 48, then it was 59 months, so. right? Are we going to work with these guys for five years? Or? So the, the proposal was kind of generic in some of those things. So we need to kind of drill down and to see how that is going to be accomplished. Because um, I'm sure the DEP saying by three years, you have to be done. That doesn't mean it's going to take five years to do all the work. Right. right. It's, a, it's a stepping stone. You have to do one phase and then build off that for the second phase Correct. and the third phase. And that's something that we'll have to review in detail, you know, before we authorize the, you know, you know, the final deliverable. Yeah, I definitely want to see that how it lines like with the DEP and the guidance that they're providing. I have one question on that since we're here. Um, that, so, and I know we're going to spend more time on the proposal, but a reverse with compliance team. Um, and I love the sound of that, but who exactly is the compliance team? Because it's come up, it comes up several times in this. Nick, you're, you're our stormwater management administrator. No, I'm not Rich's. I am. Just I, I, the training. We all did the training. Uh-huh. Okay. 
Oh, I mean, I'm appointed by the by the governing body because there has to be an appointed person for that as well on the okay. subject administrative. Yes. Okay. Rich, Rich is a good floodplains. <laughs> I'm a stormwater management coordinator. Thank you. He's the floodplain. <laughs> okay. So, I'm who who was our compliance team in the Avaki and as well as it's worded. On um, section six, LSA to provide compliance team. Yeah. Provide ongoing environment. Well, that's as far as on the on from Avaki themselves. Like, they, like they, they, they have their own. They have their own internal. Yeah, like who's the compliance team? It doesn't sound like it, that's it was vague, and uh, I didn't know if that well, was most engineering firms. You know, they have multiple engineers working for them. They're assigned to projects. And I imagine this will take place over time. It depend on, um, I'm sure he has key people set up and junior engineers set up working with them. I could ask Peter for who currently has on I'm sure why it's time. I just don't know if there's something in house here or if there was a, a new role in that. No, it's, it, that's, that's, it. that's on there. Uh, next slide. So obviously the DEP recognizes that this is a, uh, uh, a new effort and uh, a kind of renewed priority for the state and for various municipalities. And they put together a you know, notice of available funding, a booklet, which basically is available to all MS4 permittees. Um, and we completed the form, it just has to be uh, certified and executed. And it's providing $25,000 to all existing tier eight permittees to kind of help them get to this next level of, uh, of work. Because um, they recognize that this is yeah. a lot of time, energy, resources, and effort that required. And they think it's important and they want municipalities to, to jump on it and not ignore it. Um, <clears throat> so we've completed that application form. It's on a rolling basis. And we hope to certify that and also you know get that out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the the DP next slide the DP um, in their comments section of the permits um, you know there were some comments that this is an unmandated fund right? this is an unfunded unfunded mandate mm -hmm. and and they're saying no you know this is something that that municipalities need to do and they provided other mechanisms mm -hmm such as what they've considered like a rain tax or a stormwater utility to form regionally, to kind of address some of these issues, but that's that's more policy questions and more things uh, that are out there for various other discussions, but that's just from a, a kind of 10,000 elevation view, you know, some other things that other municipalities, other states, you know, other counties are, 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 are looking to do, so. That's it. Um, I just, uh, excuse me. Nick, just a, a quick question. Thank you for that overview. I feel like I just learned a ton. That was super helpful. Um, just as it relates to the, the catch basins themselves, how often are they cleaned? How are they cleaned? How, how does that process work? And is that part of um, you know, the, the, the process involved in monitoring? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the public works, we have a, a streets department and our streets department and street foremen are on the road 24 seven. You know, there are boots on the ground. Um, so when they're picking up Russian leaves, if they see an issue, if they see, you know, something going on that doesn't look right, they're the first ones to kind of notify us. And, you know, we'll take a look from, from our perspective and see if it has to be further investigated or if there's some cleaning that needs to be done. Um, and like I said, the summertime is when we do our inlet cleaning, um, our catch basin cleaning with our street sweeper and our, our vac system. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also pre and post any storm, uh, we proactively go out and check our problem areas and we check our outfalls to make sure that everything is operating pre and post uh, storm. The other thing we do is not only cleaning is we we're obligated to inspect them. Okay. And when we do the inspection, we have to note any defects. And then any material that's removed from each catch basin, we have to document the quantity of material 
also quantify that amount in our annual report. And okay. just, as, just as an example, at the last meeting, you authorized the uh, micro projects. Mm -hmm. In the if and where directed, there is a series of catch basins to be repaired in various locations throughout the borough. We felt it was a, it was a good way to try to move some of this forward. Typically, we have to go out and get quotes or do a change order or implement some of this as a larger road project. But in this case, we were able to identify five to seven, 10 locations, and that's all that's all in that, that'll all be in that bid package. Okay. Thank you. During, during the inspection, if the foreman sees a brick loose or something, uh, uh, bolts or, or, or not missing, you know, they'll, they'll, they can accomplish some of those tasks. And when the tasks mm -hmm. raise to a level where we don't have the specialized equipment or don't have the certification for confined space or other issues, then mm -hmm. the next step is to get uh, either a combination of projects together, like in the micro system that we're doing, or we wait to a bigger project, a capital improvement project, where like a Grange Avenue, where it requires specialized bulkheading or outfalls and things like that. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Nick, can you, not that this is necessarily, or at least at this time, um, what's going on in Fairview, but could you? Just describe in layman's terms what Green Street design looks like. The what? The green what? Street, or Rich, perhaps that's better directed to you. Green Street. Green Street green design. Streets. Green. As it relates to stormwater management. And so the, the, the DEP last year put out a whole best management practices on, on what they consider green infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure has a, a table of various different things. Uh, be it you know street grates that are located within the public right of way that act as like rain gardens to absorb and infiltrate stormwater associated with gutter flow or street flow. Um, there's various different um, you know pervious pavement treatments or various different things like that. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I think so. In general, I, I mean it's to me, and I haven't studied it in length, but I know a little bit. It's sort of the opposite of. Um, a hard edge that wants to quickly. Yeah, so there's, there's a this big push for work. what they consider, you know, everybody hears a landscaping. Mm -hmm. So now there's also rainscaping. Mm -hmm. So rainscaping is, is basically what you're talking about is when you're trying to incorporate environmental green infrastructure into your landscape design. Mm -hmm. And either that could be on the private side or that could be on the public side. And depending on the scale, the, the quantity, the volume of water, you could do various different things. And the DEP has a, has a table and says, that, okay, if your drainage area is this big, you can do this. If your drainage area is this big, you can do this. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's various different, you know, you know, regulations and stuff that can incorporate depending on the size and what you're trying to accomplish. Great, thanks. Thank you. This is very helpful. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm good. Anything on uh, Stormax? Again, Stormax is something that we had talked about with the Environmental Commission. Um, from it falls into our MS4 permit with regard to reporting and documenting and our stormwater um, discharge outfall points. So the Stormax that's located in Fairhaven is at the Fairhaven dock. That has a small contributing drainage area. So from the grand scheme of collecting pollutants or floatables and things like that, it doesn't really have a large engineering value to it, you know, value, you know, one to three. But it was discussed and coordinated with the Environmental Commission that from a public awareness perspective, it had a high value, nine, eight, nine, ten, because it was right at our dock and it's visible. So when people walk down to the dock for our concerts or any other type of program, they say, oh, what is this? What is it doing here? Um, and we installed it in uh, the springtime and we're monitoring it and we're looking to put some kind of placard or some kind of educational thing associated with it of how it's collecting um, you know floatables or organic waste and how that um, fits into the whole stormwater management and regulation program in Fairhaven. Maybe that could be part of the story Kristen, when we talk about caring for our natural resources and stormwater management. And Nick, it did 
it functioned as designed during the most recent storm. Yes. Yeah, our DPW guys inspected it beforehand and afterwards we, it was the first time that we actually cleaned it out and we had pictures and stuff um, that show what was in there, the debris and, and most of it was organic, um, obviously because things were, in the, things were in the gutter and flowed downhill and it hit, hit, the, uh, hit the water body. Yeah. Is there anything different that you need from the governing body up here as you embark? Because this is extremely involved, it's extremely complex. Yeah, so look, the, the way I look at it is like I said, we're Fairhaven in its entirety, and everybody, the residents, the, the, the public officials, the volunteers, the different groups, the employees, we're all on the same team and we're all have that stormwater driver's license in our pocket and we're all responsible for some aspect and some part. This is not one person's responsibility. This is all of our responsibilities in some fashion or form. And that's what we need help with. Yeah, very important. I'm good. All right, uh, I'm gonna slightly pivot here uh, in the order, uh, just so that Nick doesn't have to hang around all night. I'm gonna go to public comment on agenda items only so that uh, those of you in the public or online can ask Nick questions, um, if you may have them, about stormwater management. Uh, then I will continue back onto workshop, and then we're going to go back to a separate public comment after that. So just now, I'm going to ask uh, if there's anyone in the public that has public comment just on stormwater management items only, please stand and identify yourself by clearly stating your name and address for the record. Please try to observe the time limit of three minutes. Is there anyone in the public? Yes. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. It's Cindy Long. Um, I, I was curious when you were talking about the study by Rutgers. I don't have a chat over. Have we done any of this and we implemented any of the projects that they recommended? I think there were 13 different locations that they were hoping to yes. engage around. We have, um, off the top of my head, I believe the normal school project was one of the locations where they did a rain garden. Um, you know, some of the other locations in town were uh, part of the discussion that the, the Acme, the, the Acme Center, they did some dry well uh, installation, that did the roof leaders. Wouldn't it be nice if they added some trees in the parking lot? Right, because isn't that one of the things you said that tree and adding? Yeah, there's always opportunities for yeah. us to do, you know, various different uh, uh, stormwater treatments and stuff, but it, it also it's a balancing act with regard to what the developers, what the organization, and the board decides. Yeah. Now, look at this parking lot out here that everything just runs right down the street. Right. Is there ever any consideration? Something to adding some sort of obviously our, our um we have a stronger hand when it's new development. Mm -hmm. When it's existing development, it's a lot harder to get a developer or applicant to perform or, or do additional upgrades to their stormwater system. That being said, the municipality always has the option to you know kind of incorporate more streaming ordinances. I make it a consideration. Um, I just have one last thing. The, um, the, you talked about the um, storm water and the tree. It, it seemed like there was an opportunity to incorporate something in the tree ordinance. It's under review, um, like capturing storm water, planting, replanting, or something we should be considering. Yeah, there definitely should be communication between the Shade Tree Commission, the Planning Board, you know, all the different, the Green Team or the Environmental Commission, and, and taking a look at um, our MS4 permit and the compliance, you know, worksheets and steps that we need to do, and if we could somehow incorporate those together, especially with this new 2023 renewal, you know, we should take, uh, you know, take advantage of that. It's something we could look at and incorporating into the uh, new shade tree ordinance yeah. or like storm water management. We could look at that as well. Well, I mean, I know they've got postponed. So, yeah, June, June yeah. 12th. So, the 
can we do something in the meantime to try to, I don't know. We can certainly look at it from a legal perspective. If the governing body wants to, I don't think if, if the question is whether we're looking to amend the current ordinance as it is now before we put into effect the total new ordinance that we're considering, I don't think that's something that we would probably take on with everything going on right now. But I think our goal is to get the new ordinance done as quickly as possible. Um, unfortunately, it's being taken off of the agenda tonight. We didn't get the draft until today in the middle of the day. So that's not a criticism. It's just we don't have we didn't have enough time to look at it in order to discuss it tonight in, in a way that made sense for the borough fair. I guess I'm just saying if this whole you know MS work has to be attended to, maybe it would be important to incorporate that. In the new ordinance, absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. that's what uh, right. you know sure. Attorney Sobel is suggesting. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I will say the the DEP does require tree ordinance, but our tree ordinance is, is far in superior to what they're requiring municipalities to adopt at this stage. We're, we're ahead of that. <coughs> Sometimes don't have any tree ordinance, so. But with, under these new regs, they do require to have one, so that's good news for New Jersey. We can do better. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the public? Hi everyone, I'm Michael Vincelli, back from River Road. I'm here as a, um, a resident who has definitely been affected by our stormwater management for the last three and a half years. I know that you've all been wonderful in listening, but it's definitely gotten to the point where it's not okay. And I'm concerned about the safety of our residents because River Road is really flooding. Um, I have videos if anyone does want to see them, but fully flooding to the point of about here. So then the cars have to run through the middle of the road. And um, in the last storm, I kind of panicked, I'll admit it, and I don't usually panic, but um, I did call 911 because we were completely surrounded by water up to here in my backyard and the front it was going up to our porch. And they did say, you're know, probably the worst house in all of Fairhaven, the worst flooding. And what's happening is it's coming off of, which I know is a county road, River Road, it's coming down my driveway. It's also coming down my neighbor's driveway, turning into my driveway, and then pooling and sitting in a basin in my backyard because of the colonial port. Um, development that was built around it. So my questions are, one, how do we, how does the town identify problems? You know, like the problem spots. Has this been identified as a problem spot? And would this count as one of the projects that maybe fell through the cracks that you mentioned, maybe fell through some of the cracks? And I guess I wonder how much of the ongoing borough development would even hold to the standards now of the new regulations and how will we handle those developments moving forward? I'm assuming that since they were passed before these new regulations that they stand as they are. But I do have some major concerns. And now not only is my yard sitting with water for an entire day, but it's now affected all my neighbors because even though they're higher, it's seeping because there's nowhere else to go into their basement. So my neighbor who's never flooded before had to have um, water pumped out for two days after the storm. My other neighbor who's been there for 50 years has never been flooded and she flooded this time. So it's going to increase. I also am on the Environmental Commission. So I come at this from that perspective too. Um, and to that point, I do wonder about the new pocket parks we're pushing through, if how they close they come to these standards and were they looked at through the lens of, of the rainscaping? Like had that been considered when we did these initial plans for that? What else do we have? Uh, let's see. The Stormax. I just want to confirm the Stormax had nothing to do with, like, just because of the environmental commission, I did help push that through. So they had nothing to do with the initial, like, any of the flooding that happened this last storm. Do you think that they played any part in the flooding? No. Okay. Because it was identified by all people, just even online. So I just wanted to clarify that the Stormax, because then I felt like, oh, great, I just caused my problem. I asked anymore. the same question. They actually even reached out to Stormax, if I recall. They said it worked exactly okay. as it was. Okay. So that's yeah. that's yeah. a high tide problematic. Our tide. Yeah, high tide I, was problematic. the thing is, I get that, it, but high tide is going to continue to be problematic. We're only getting worse. So it's been three years. It literally tidal waves into my house mm -hmm. and is on our main road, you know. And we did ask the police, like, and the firemen, even other neighbors, like, should we close River Road? Because it's, it is a concern. No one can walk or ride their bikes. They're not that many people are, but. You cannot walk. I mean, my backyard was literally up to my waist. 
for an entire day. And I know that you came a couple of years ago and said that it always flooded, but I don't know that that's well, to, sufficient. just to, to answer one of your questions, following that storm, I reached out to the developer's engineer. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation. They were, spe they were scheduled to go out the next day or that afternoon, actually, to further investigate because, as you know, that project's not closed down. Mm -hmm. So um, they're looking at options and alternatives. They're meeting with their client, the developer. They're supposed to email us some information, some mapping, some sketches. So we can further review all this um, as part of this whole process with this project. Are they taking into consideration the, the slope as well? Because the way it's being held up now is the fence that's being pushed over. So the 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 grading just hits the fence and then ends. So if you took the fence down, it would just be like it would crumble right. essentially. <clears throat> so as, I just hope that that would be part of this consideration. Now the fence is still there. But the fence is being now pushed down because the land is being that's being used to hold up or seemingly hold up. We will certainly further just we talked to them about that in the past <clears throat> and we'll continue. And then how would that fit in with Colonial Court, the beginning of Colonial Court? Because that obviously really flooded now. But you know, it affects me too because that comes down Smith. So not only is it coming from hands, it's coming from Smith and it's turning into River Road and meeting at my house and then coming down my driveway. So I wonder. Are we doing an over like when we're doing this overall look? Are we looking at that flow that's coming? It's all being diverted down into one space. Like, is how do we identify those without me coming up here and saying? No, I mean we're we're aware of those problem areas. We are aware that the intersection of Colonial Court and Smith has historically had issues. We've identified some. Um, areas that need some improvement, which will help alleviate some of that. What kind um, of just out of curiosity? It's like actually it's it's a, it, there's a bottleneck. There's the size of the pipe, the size yeah. of the existing. So the pipe up across on the north side of the, the system goes from the intersection of Foreman and Smith out to, um, I mean, the intersection of Smith and Colonial goes out to Foreman, mm -hmm. down Foreman, out to Hans. Down hands all the way to the river. So we had the pipe televised. We identified mm -hmm. some intrusion. In on the hands one or the hands. hands? Yeah. Was uh, that part of the problem the first time when it came? This is uh it 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 all compounds the problem. Yeah. Some of those residents have actually taken some of those trees down mm -hmm. in, uh, along hands. Um oh yeah, actually. Okay. You'll, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see some of that. The, and you think uh, that's affected some of the catching of the water? No, no. Oh, because of the pipe. I got you. The roots of those okay. trees. I got you. So that was so bad that you would actually have to go in and cut the roots out. That's how that's wow. bad it got. The pipe at Foreman, um, we actually might be looking at submitting uh, a roadway improvement project to DOT, and that would take, we've always had Foreman kind of like on our five year list mm -hmm. um, to do some improvements, and that would include the drainage. Is there consideration of making uh, something from colonial, the front of colonial court go down and out somewhere? Because from my understanding, it's more of just a catch underneath at the end of colonial court. So, so is there the, any consideration? In general, there? just not to talk specific about this project, but in general, when an application for development goes to the planning board, the, the applicant's engineer prepares a, a drainage report and drainage mm -hmm. design. And when they prepare that report, they look at the existing drainage conditions. Mm -hmm. And then based on the DEP rules and regulations, they need to meet certain standards and certain reductions of post-development flow. Mm -hmm. So their design, which whatever it was, an underground storage system mm -hmm. or whatever, that connects the, that connects back into the existing system mm -hmm. at a reduced rate. Now that well, again, <laughs> as part of that, as part of that, usually as engineers and the developers at the developers engineers looks at failure and they want to make sure that there's overland relief for a specific system so yes, if it's it, just so if it does if it does fail it's not impacting downstream structures or, or things or what have you yeah. <laughs> so this project obviously the applicants engineers made some representations or made a specific design and that design has never been completed because or is in the process of being completed or being reviewed as part of that development application 
Um, that's where, where Rich is working with the applicant's engineer to, to see where that status is and how they can finalize it or adjust it to meet what was part of the original approval process at the, at the board level. So, but see, um, thinking yeah. that it's a, it was approved correctly and that's what they did pass forward, if it isn't working, then what is the next step? Like, they went up to code and they did everything that they were supposed to do, which is kind of what I've been told. What is the next step then? I'm saying when it comes to some of this, is to Nick's point, it's either failing or not. I hate to use the word not designed properly or possibly wasn't built properly. So I know you said that it was approved. Well, we're, well, approved. we're approving a plan that you know is based on a, an analysis of the drainage area based on the software that's you know inputted in and all the data and and look what the numbers show for that particular project we even had them go beyond the, the normal drainage basin mm -hmm. to capture a lot of those extra properties um and we've said it too. There's a reason why that property was left undeveloped for so long. It was a challenge. It's a challenge. It was I was under the impression they weren't allowed to build for years there. So um, yeah, I mean, it was. It, it went through several different versions of design um, based on the developer. He came back a few times, you know. So to Nick's point, we're working with them. We we've, we've got the the applicants engineer. Um, looking into all this, and they're supposed to be following up. We should have something any day now. Um, and I understand it's a multi problem issue because it's coming from the front. It's can I answer that question? Is there a way the borough can put this on an expedited timeline? I mean, I heard about this problem at least a year ago, maybe over a year ago. Um, so this has been going on, as far as I know, for a long time, um, and I know it rained a lot, but the notion that you would have water up to that level in your backyard or a house that is in front of the river road seems completely unreasonable to me. So I, I, I don't know about the rest of the council, I'll urge the council maybe to put this on a fast track to find some resolution. I don't know what that is because I'm not an expert, but essentially put this on a timeline um, because it's not reasonable for another six months or a year to go, go by without a resolution. It, it just really seems like there's a major issue there. And that puts us very ill-prepared for potentially a bigger rainstorm. Um, and I think as, as was mentioned uh, by Michael, it's affected multiple homes because then the water sits and doesn't have where to go that can destroy your basement. Oh everyone really um, lost that's like they lost costly and once you get mold in there, mm -hmm. you, you're talking to some serious issues mm -hmm. to get rid of that mold. So I would I would urge the council to consider you know asking for this to be fast tracked because I, I do know this is an issue that's been going on. But it's just not, it's, it's, that's not reasonable. Obviously, there's a major problem. And if it's an issue with the developer, then they should be placed on a real fast timeline to be working with us, or there should be consequences. If it goes beyond that, then we really should do a study to figure out how to resolve it, because it's 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 rid of a road. And uh, you know, it's, it's fairly important. Rich, is this that house that hasn't been finished on Colonial Court for like two, three years? Yeah. I mean, that's a separate issue. It has nothing yeah. to do with storm water I mean, management there. Part of the development in itself, um, I think what we need to do is talk to our legal team and review the developer's agreement, review the approvals. Is this still a planning board? It's still bonded. The, yeah. You know, all the improvements are still bonded. Nothing's been released. It's still paid for cold sack. You know, they've got some work to do out there. Um, well, well, even you know, the we all know this, the, the situation with the one house is an issue, and, and that's why things aren't moving. Been a legal issue for two years. Three. To be honest, that house it will affect it too because he's not fully built up the right. ground above me yet. It's mostly, but that house isn't affecting most of it. It's the fact that everything was lifted 
around my yard and it can't go anywhere else. But isn't there a lot next to that house that's meant for stormwater management? That is what? Isn't there a lot next to that house that's not finished meant for stormwater management or there's a specific area next to that house? I'm trying to- It is, that's that. done though. So that was my last, last question. Is that riprap that's there? Is that like the final, what they're thinking like that was really what was supposed to catch all the water? Where that riprap is in the pipe? The riprap with the flared end pipe was to catch some of that overflow and get it out the answer road. I just wonder about the safety of that in general though, because it's sort of in an area that like a kid could fall and there's all these huge mounds of riprap. I just, if that's like our solution moving forward, I might look at that as well, because I don't think it's safe right there. I'm not trying to stress everyone out, but <laughs> it is a big issue and it's affecting more people. I know more people in town are flooded than ever. Um, I just don't want this to happen to anyone else who's yeah. getting developed yeah. around. And I have to project. say, if, this yeah. one, if it's one builder, yeah, you know, basically their problem is becoming a neighborhood problem, which is right. now becoming a regional problem. I'm concerned about traffic and emergency route access along the river road. When you have flooding like that, it, 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 it can set off a catastrophe, uh, a, a real domino of catastrophe. Um, and if we can trace this issue back to unknown um, condition, let's say, then we need to lean in and address it. I I really feel for your family, my oh, thank you. Um, and I happen to know but... others in your neighborhood also had flooded homes, and I've spoken with them. Yeah. Um, and it very well may be more than one issue. It but is. The ones we it. can go <laughs> and effectively yeah. um, tie off, we should do so, so immediately. So um, I just want to bring this all over a little bit. Directions. First of all, I think you know everyone on this day is very sensitive to this issue, 100%. Um, and that day was spectacular. And it wasn't just a lot of extra flooding in the ferry, but it was extra flooding everywhere. That being said, it's an issue. I mean, we, 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 yeah. we, know, we noticed that it's an issue. I hear what you said. I don't disagree with you. The only thing is that we're committing to a prioritization matrix. We should commit to a prioritization matrix. So we should get the details of what the job would entail, what that might be, put it in there. And if it's something that's a life safety issue, which it sounds like it may be, on its own, that would prioritize itself to the top. Um, you know, just to that point, also, you know, if there's a way for any of the residents who did flood, who you guys might not know about, to, I don't know, even just like a call to people saying, like, hey, let us know, only because if I didn't speak up, you guys wouldn't know necessarily, and we, we got a lot of calls, but I know what you're saying. I know yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. If there was anything we could pick out of that huge storm, is that the, the weaknesses or vulnerabilities in yeah. the system were no, they're showing themselves. So, well, thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Hi, Michael. I have a question for you. Sure. If God forbid, there has been an emergency, an yeah. actual name, yeah, exactly. Yeah, two thirty Oxford Avenue. If there had been an emergency, like, do you think that an emergency vehicle could have gotten to your to your home? Yes. Or to your neighbors? Yes. But flood. I mean, that depends. I mean, the water. Yes. Most of those vehicles are higher. They probably could have, but it would have been hard, especially on the colonial court, though. I think where it pulled. I mean, it's definitely it's not a clear yeah. 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 I mean, we were surrounded. We were, our house is literally like you couldn't walk to a dry piece of patch of land from my house. My only other question, this is not me belittling the situation because yeah. I've addressed that I yes. agree this is uh, Saturday it rained a lot, it was pouring. This Saturday. Yeah. Did, was there flooding or no? No. It wasn't. No. Okay. So the rain that's coming down is not affected. Like it's not the rainfall, the amount it's of rainfall time. that's hitting my house. Too that's not what's flooding. It's definitely when the still when the pipes don't can't hold the capacity on the front, it flows down and then sits because of the way it was built up. Is my guess. The, the reason I was asking though is we had a problem on that road um, six months ago before yeah. they did the river road yes. issue. So it sounds to me like that specific issue may have been fixed because if we got a lot of rain the other day and that didn't flood, that fixed. And so now yeah. it's more of the existential uh, high tide, no pipe overflowing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Anyone else? Is it Stephanie continuing? I, 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 <laughs> <it's a different laughs> <question>. <laughs> Stephanie Adams. <laughs> 230 Oxford Avenue. Um, I wanted to go back to the um, sub pumps and the, the runoff um, on Oxford Avenue. And I'm sure this happens all over town. We have a lot of new builds um, where the sub pump, 
uh, outflows have been kind of placed somewhere on their front lawn, various different, not, not even close to the curb. Sometimes they're in the middle of the lawn. Um, we, uh, the creek, Schwenker Creek runs underneath part of Oxford. And so a lot of these pumps are just constantly, even when it's not raining, they're just constantly pumping out water. It's, you know, picking up what's ever on their lawns and then it's running into the street gutters, picking up whatever's in the road and then going into the creek. So I guess to Tr Tracy's point, um, it, it's a lot, and I've spoken to a couple of residents of the new builds and they're like, well, we had, you know, they don't know moving into one of these new homes. And I guess what mechanism can we have in place that will um, prevent builders from, I, I don't know if my answer is going to be accurate. So <laughs> Nick and Rich jump in if it isn't, but part of the new land use ordinance is that the builders um, can't build up to build down. And by doing that, they were building up to build down. And I, I think that they were building closer to the water, the water sources. So I assume that would mean there would be less sump pump activity based on the new builds, based on the new land use rules. Is that inaccurate, Nick? No, it's 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 in the in the ballpark there. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it's wrong. <laughs> so so the last few years, the last few years, the, the mayor and council has also passed additional ordinances regarding uh, separation between the seasonal high ground water table and, and the finished floor of the, of the basement area. So it was a rule of thumb. Generally, most developers had kind of had done that, but when we codified it, they required that to do that. So when an applicant submits a new build, they have to do geotechnical work. And they have to get someone, an engineer or a geotechnical licensed geotechnical guy, to come out and take a look at the soil conditions and the groundwater table, and they have to identify where that that level is, and then they have to take a factor of safety of two feet before they set their their basement or cellar floor. So that two feet allows for the groundwater that infiltrates from the rain and that problem pollinates in the aquifer to kind of go underneath that. So it, that's one of the things that the Marion Council has done to kind of help alleviate some of those sump pump issues. And so for, for any issues that aren't being alleviated, heavy rains or whatever, have we ever thought about maybe a requirement for a rain garden in the area of the outflow that would then infiltrate that water back into the yeah. ground as opposed to have it run into yeah, the so, street? So our ordinance says that for new building construction, uh, a house is required to have a drywall and they connect their roof leaders into the drywall and that infiltrates down into the, into the ground. Um, there are cases where people on a Saturday morning decide to put in a pipe from the downspout and discharge it into, into the roadway. And on a Monday morning, we'll get a call or email and have to go out to the, the subject property and inform them that that's not allowed. And one of the measures that they, they Accomplish is by putting those pop up inlets mm -hmm. in somewhere in the lawn where, if they have a downspout or have a sump part, some pump discharge, um, it, it's far enough away from the house where it's not leaking back into their into the cellar, what have you. But it's allowed to infiltrate downstream and infiltrate into the ground. Uh, in theory, but what we've seen is it rushing over the grass to the extent where not the splinter because it wasn't really that cold, but where we have, you know, ice slicks right. running right. down the street. No, um, we have them, we have them all documented the DPW missed a call and we had to go salt them for school and everything. Um, if, it's, if it's cold enough. Um, okay. But a lot of those instances are, are old existing <laughs> pre-existing conditions, especially Oxford, Cambridge, some of those areas there. Okay. But that, uh, Stephanie, one of the things I hear you talking about is how homeowners are not thinking about what's the best way to do. They're just thinking about, let me get this water out of the basement. Right. You're not thinking about where it's going after that. But there, there might be sort of an awareness uh, campaign, if you want to call it that, a way to message around, you know, if you have a sump pump, here's a good way to deal with it. Because it will just remain on site, go back in your water table. Yeah. So it's that green infrastructure, right? That's all part mm -hmm. of it. 
And that's what Mike Gianforte from Two Rivers was saying today. The other option that people do is they connect with some pumps into the slop sink, and then they're basically treating the water you're paying for the treatment of that, and your rates go up. Right. So that's the other aspect that he's trying to do with, with Barry and other municipalities to deal with some of that I and I, the infiltration and the inflows. Which again, you know, as an individual resident, if you if you were required to build the spring garden, right, then you could filter it and have it go back into the ground instead of um, running into the street. Yeah. Um, and then my other, um, Josh, <laughs> we talked about this really quick on the green tape call before we got cut off. Um, the, and I'm just, I'm speaking on behalf of, I think Kelly's on the call, but the Environmental Commission applied for, this is about rain gardens, the Environmental Commission applied for um, an ANJEC grant to build a rain garden. Um, we didn't receive the grant, um, but we would like to just, uh, <clears throat> we would like to privately fund a rain garden um, for, to sort of serve as a, you know, uh, uh, demonstration fund? a demonstration we we're not sure if it's going to be a memorial we haven't figured that all out yet but 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 the the grant was to build a rain garden at uh carter pond given the state that it was in during this last heavy rainstorm we figured that um now more than ever it would be a useful project so we're hoping to privately crowdfund that and possibly make it some sort of a memorial um for the O'Neill family, but we were one. My question to you is: Do we had a resolution to apply for the grant? We were denied. Do we need a resolution to? Do we need permission? A resolution to give us permission to uh, raise funds privately and install a rain garden at the heart of Park? I take that as a huge compliment that you think that I know the I'm answer. I'm looking right at you. Because well, <laughs> I'm the only one. I think it's fair to say that we now. Uh, we have to wait at the car pond until we saw some resolution of some other issues that we're dealing with over there related to you know, being handled by an outside engineering firm. So um, at this juncture, I would think that you know we couldn't even entertain talking about that until past the fall when we dealt with the second tier of whatever happened. I understand, I understand that answer completely. Let's say there wasn't that issue. Would would they need a new? I would, yes, because it, it 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 would go through the intake process as, 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 like anything else. Because it would need to be otherwise coordinated with the borough and with borough staff to have something like that happen. And the design would have to be reviewed. I'm sure you know, make sure that it's and there's a, there's a lot of work that can be done ahead of that mm -hmm. to get. I'm going to call it a swag estimate, right? Mm -hmm. of design and build and these other components. So. So yeah, more than happy, more than happy to help support that. Right, but with Carter Pond, I, I understand that, that there might be some delays, so we might want to reconsider the yeah. location. But we'll work on that, and then we'll come back to you guys. Okay. But you do you have some building blocks from your experience at Knollwood that can inform mm -hmm. a project in a different location. Yeah, for so sure. Starting from I know the environmental commission had a list of areas where they were interested in rain gardens. Yes. That, you know, you certainly can take a look at. Yeah, we, you know, it was a, a, a passion project for Robin O'Neill, uh, but I understand that, that that might not be feasible at this moment. So we'll work on that. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Is anyone else in the public just on stormwater management? Is anyone on Zoom? Yes. I'm yes. One says RBJ, but I think it might be Mrs. Blazer. <laughs> Good evening. I want to address this sort of to Michael as well as the council because I've got perspective you folks don't have on this flooding on River Road. I've lived here for 50 some odd years. Michael, it was flooding long before you bought your house. The same thing. The problem being that technically what is now being built on at Colonial Court should be considered wetlands. I had a friend who lived on Colonial Court two doors from this, and there was a house that stood where the now unfinished one stands that was so full of mold, it was condemned, it was boarded up. Somewhere in the borough records, you have to have records of this. 
and it never should have been subdivided. It should have been kept as wetlands. One of the criteria that the DEP uses is that if water doesn't perk in three days, it's wetlands. Yet they approved the subdivision of this and the builder put in truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of fill. This never should have happened. It should still be wetlands. At one point we called it Lake Muddy because there was a house on Hans Road that had a patio with an Adirondack chair and it looked as if it was overlooking this lake. And it went on for more than the three days that the DEP's criteria was that between the borough and the DBT, DEP, this should never have been developed. You have my sympathy, Michael, that wood has been running down that driveway for as far back as I can remember. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Can I just say something real quick? Is that okay? So it, it is right. That's what I was told. It came down. The problem is because they built it up, now it has nowhere to go. So it just yeah. sits there. Like before it could drain and it would drain into the wetlands, I wasn't the only area. There was way more space for that water to go. Yeah. But I, now there's nowhere for it. I, I just want to point out that Ruth can be right and you can be right at the same time where there's still that issue no, there. I'm, and we, yeah. No, and we, I'm agreeing yeah. with her. I'm agreeing with yeah. her. Okay. And, but it's, that's and we still feel horrible that it's happening. So, Allison? I have Tom and Carolyn Perkinson. Hi, how are you? It's Carolyn Ferguson, Seven Colonial Court. Um, some of you know this, but I just want to make sure kind of everybody's level set. Um, at the intersection of Smith Street and Colonial, um, our neighbor, Dave Bordelon, and us, we have a long email thread going that goes back to 2019, full of photos and videos. Um, I just want to make sure like what happened at that corner in the April storm, while it was slightly worse than usual, uh, that flooding happens regularly. You know, it's three or four times a year. We know how it works. We know what the timing is like. Um, we know that we have to get out of our driveway at a certain point if we want to get out of our driveway. Um, and, you know, I did send a video, which I think some of you saw really of the water just traveling down the uh, driveway from the Acme into that corner. And it, it, that really seems to be a, a serious contributor to the problem. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Wow. Anyone else? Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back into workshop uh, potential <laughs> projects for Monday. Let Nick go. Oh, yeah, Nick, you, Monday Night Football, whatever you're going to do. Yeah. Okay. Potential okay. projects for NJD. Yeah, great job, man. Potential projects for NJDOT grant funding cycle. It's me. Uh, it's this time of year that we have to submit for our, um, if we consider local aid through NJDOT. The, um, the process is usually we select a street. We submit a grant on behalf of the borough. It's all done through the online portal. It's due end of June, July, I think it is. I don't have the paperwork in front of me. Yeah. Uh, they just sent out the grant solicitation. So, for example, Hanson Cooney was the one we did. That was for 2021. 2022 is Fairhaven Road Phase 1. Which we have the base mapping for, which will be design shortly. We have one pending for Ferry and Road Phase 2, which would be from the Carter to Ridge Road. So that hasn't been funded yet. So we have to go through a selection process of what roads we would you know, submit and priority. So at our engineering and DPW committee meeting, we had talked about resubmitting for Ferry and Road Phase 2. We also talked about, which I've always had on the list, I mentioned it earlier, was the improvements to Foreman Street, and that would also capture some of that drainage. Uh, to design what extent would that uh, would impact the drainage issue? Uh, Excuse me? To what extent would Foreman, because it's a Smith connection? Because it's a Smith connection, yes. Okay. Yes. And then, and the Hans connection. So yeah. Be able to. We could do kind of take a look at that whole area. And then um, 
those are the top two, in my opinion. Yeah. And then we also have like this a secondary is maybe like Linden mm -hmm. um, is in need of resurfacing and some uh, rework as well. So you can submit more than one. You could put priority number one, priority number two on your applications. They will review them in the order that you prioritize them. The issue we have is we don't know if Fairhaven Road Phase 2 will be funded. It's at the discretion of the DOT commissioner. We had a Zoom call with the local aid team about two or three weeks ago. They basically know as much as we do. It's it's in the pile, it's in the list. Um, yeah, so what I would recommend is we have the framework done for phase two. We can simply dust off that application, resubmit. Mm -hmm. I'll update the cost estimate as necessary. And then I would also recommend submitting uh, format. Mm -hmm. I have some estimates that have been done historically on that road as well, based on the improvements that need to be done, uh, whether it's curbing, milling, paving, ADA upgrades, uh, drainage, from where sidewalk. That would go from cedar all the way to hands. Huh. That's a nice complete run. So, so bottom line, two two projects you're suggesting, very phase two, Foreman. Mm -hmm. Foreman has two aspects that can potentially alleviate stormwater issues that we've talked about. The other data point I think that's important is if the commissioner tomorrow funded phase two, whatever we choose as priority two would shift to priority one. Is that a fair yeah, statement? So if we submitted Fairhaven phase two and Foreman, let's say we are, but we did, and then Fairhaven phase two was funded by the commissioner, Foreman would automatically become number one. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to think through because if there's excess money, right? You heard here with the COVID money, there was um, 29 million or much more money, right? If that gets funded, the number two then becomes the number one for review of the credit. So I just want to make sure that data points up front. And just to add, the Fairhaven phase two would incorporate the drainage improvements that would be needed as you approach the natural area. You've got some runoff, you've got some roadside erosion, you've got some storm stormwater management issues down there as well. So that was going to capture that as well as part of that road and road infrastructure. I got video from that section as well. Actually, What's that? I got video from the yes. storm on that end of town too. So to meet your deadline, what do you need from the governing body? Because obviously you can't just flip a switch and get everything done for submission and June beginning of July, right? We would uh, we actually have to do a resolution authorizing the submission of the grant. So tonight we just wanted to talk through the workshop session. And then hopefully I would think put a resolution on for the next meeting. Um, Rich, do we need to in the resolution? Because one of the things uh, I'm wondering how much, what, what do we want to reference in the resolution? Because I know sometimes the resolution language is more limited to road work, sidewalks, and storm drains. Right, in general. The resolution is somewhat generic to well. the grant yeah. application. I don't want it to bind us when we get to design and we're looking at it and we're saying, well, geez, we know we, we want to do a crosswalk, but that wasn't articulated. You're, you're, I think you're talking about the grant itself. The resolution that you would, would pass just, mm -hmm. is just authorizing submission for the improvements to Ferry and Road Phase 2 project. It doesn't so, get it doesn't get into any specifics. So the later grant, later. conceptually being as a grant would have the cost estimate, a small map, a description of work, a narrative, you know, everything that would go into that grant. Okay. But and then ultimately the plans would need to be approved by entry the OT all. And ultimately when which goes out the bit. And through the oh, governing body so. process. But I, I want to hit that point even harder. Mm -hmm. So are you I think what I think you're asking, right? I just want to make sure I'm not misremembering. Is do any restrictions come with the grant money that would limit design flexibility? I'll call it. So, is there any way to know what the parameters of the grant money are? Well, the I uh, the way I understand it, and Rich, you should jump in and correct. But the, the, they're going to look to our design to say that's that's a fundable project. That's a great. Complete street needs sort of policy things like we've been pledged on complete streets. It's going to look at a whole bunch of stuff and our narrative and the design is going to reflect that. 
I just didn't want to see us get handcuffed in any way down the road when maybe there's some outreach from the community that wants to talk about something specific to the design, but we didn't have it in the resolution. Now, if the resolution is just simply, it's endorsing the grant yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. I got my answer. Yeah, I'm good too. All right. Good. So next governing by me, the resolution go to the grant and then we'll resolution level seven the prioritization. After that, or are you going to come with a recommendation at the 12th meeting with what you're going to include in the grant? The resolution and the grant writing usually run concurrently, just okay. because from a timing perspective. So I'll be working on things, yep. knowing that resolution's coming. And that's like the last piece that the clerk will submit. Okay. Um, is it through the portal or do they want hard copy still? Portal. Okay. And any extra investigative work on foreman focused on the components that would alleviate some of the stormwater issues with Rex and I would be most welcome for the next couple yes. of years. Yes, and then in the grant, I normally write it in such a way to capture some of those improvements and then have a placeholder for a cost for drainage or stormwater upgrades. And so at least it's in there yeah, exactly. until we really start gathering data and design. Check, okay. check, Great. awesome. Great job. All right, thanks. Thank you. Uh, moving along, and Attorney Sobel here, and discuss the draft short-term rental ordinance. Um, I I actually have a question right off the bat. That's all right. Uh, looking at four dash four point three. This is my same question for Attorney Cannon on the phone the other day. Hold on one second. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was it? 4-4.3. Oh, yeah. So regulations pertain to short-term rentals. Yes. Yeah, so yes. under under B, okay, it seems to make an exception. That's how I read it. And the way it was explained to me by Attorney Cannon is he thought the exception had to be there. Or the ordinance wouldn't wouldn't stick, and and what he discussed at the time was that you could do a, for instance, you could do seven days there, and I asked, can we do thirty days instead? And he said he knew what I was trying to achieve, but now it just looks like there's an exclusion, and I'm, I'm, uh, that's what I'm trying to get my head around is. Um, you know, if, if you're sharing a property with another person that lives there and owns it, you know, it's owner occupied, right? You're a house guest. So, why, why do we have to make an exclusion for a short term rental based on those facts? Well, I think there's a differentiation being, between it being a house guest and someone that is renting out a particular. I agree. That's what I think we don't want. That's the part that I, I, it keeps popping up in here. I feel like this is the fourth iteration of this that we've had. And this correct me if I'm wrong up here, but I thought we just wanted to say, we're not doing short-term rentals on any 125 days. It doesn't matter whether it's someone living in a house with someone or, you know, of course we want it to be legal. So if that's the answer, then- Well, so, it comes down to a rational basis test. Um, it's what the Supreme Court and the U.S. you know the federal courts have looked at you know, the constitutionality right. of the short-term rentals. Um, I believe that uh, Greg provided two cases, one out of Point Pleasant, which looked at a seven uh, seven day seven day limitation, and then Belmar, which tried to do a complete ban. A complete ban is will not pass muster, right? It affects, you know, impacts someone's you know due process rights and rights to privacy and rights to you know mm -hmm. operate their property. Okay. Um, now they found that the seven term seven day limit in Point Pleasant was in fact rational, and it furthered the government's uh, position as to how to regulate and govern the municipality. So I spoke with Greg 
earlier today, and we discussed, obviously, you know, we do a, a fair share of real estate litigation. And 125, he said, might be a little bit excessive, but I, I believe that you maybe spoke about something a little bit shorter of a term. For that exception, we discussed 30 days. Okay. On the phone. Would that be passable in your opinion? I, I mean, you never know, but like, yeah. I mean, listen, we, we would be willing to defend it, absolutely. Um, I think 30 days is more than fine. Um, I understand, you know, obviously the goal when we first spoke months ago was to look at that, you know, that, that differentiation between a, a, a short, a short-term rental of, or a seasonal rental of 125 days or less and a, a regular lease term, you know, something that, you know, six months or so. Um, and I know we were, we were looking at trying to pass that 125 day seasonal term uh, but, um, restriction. I think 30 days would absolutely be something that would be easy to defend. And I, I believe it suits what our purpose is here. And as, you know, has been clearly pointed out, I don't believe we have an issue in this town. So I don't believe it will really come up, but there is always, listen, we, we, we don't want to say, oh, well, it never happened. So let's just put it wherever we want and just defend the statute. I want to be clear with what I'm suggesting though. I'm still suggesting to stay with 125 days. I'm suggesting a second 30 day exception under 443-50. That's what I'm sorry. Okay. I wasn't saying to lower it from 125 to 30. I was saying to keep the 125 okay. and under 4-4.3, where we're talking about... Um, so it'd be 30 days if it meets one of those exceptions. Under maybe maybe 21 two. days. I mean, I, you know, but but seven days to me, again, brings you back into that, oh, we're renting a house and ferry it into the week. Understood. Let's go party. Mm -hmm. Or, or <laughs> right as it is stated right here, I understand. we're renting it for the night. Let's go for it. And, you know, all it takes is one time. That's so. And I want to come back to you, a comment too, um, that Peter Chesney made um, at the last meeting. He was talking about some of the discrepancies. So it looks like the definition, and Peter, I know you'll probably come on and talk through a little bit, but I want to make sure that we address that discrepancy. So last time there was just variations in the number of days and whatnot, and we're sticking with the 125 days. And then that sounds like the updated guidance is the exception on the 30 days or less. So I just want to make sure. I know Peter's on the phone and that was a really good catch last night. I just want to make sure are we sure. all on the same page with 125 days. That's what he said. That was a. Uh, so I'm just trying to find some precedent for 125 days. And I don't know if there is any. There is. The only it reason we came like, up with 125 was because I, of the seasonal. Yeah, I understand. Um, I'm just concerned we put something on the, we don't have a problem right now yet, but also I don't want to put something on the books that um, immediately gets challenged and then we're going to have business on that with, with a lawsuit. So I'm trying to find something that's already been defended that we know will stand the muster in the state courthouse. And I, I found something in Milburn. I found certain day, certain numbers of days. I also pulled some folks that I shared with, with the mayor. Um, and it felt like 90 was going to be something much more defendable than 125. I'm curious, do you guys, you guys represent a lot of towns, like what is the, uh, you know, like my Googling for, you know, the number of days and lawsuits is ridiculous, um, because it's not my job, but like, you know, I'm sure that it's all public information. Can you guide us? So, yeah, so we obviously we represent Bradley Beach. Um, we're also... We used to be in Belmore. So an outright ban is completely unconstitutional. Yeah. And it will be struck down every single time. So therefore you have to go to what the other, you know, fairly recent case, which was in Point Pleasant, which is a seven day. So it's a lot of gray area. It's not, it, there's no black letter law that establishes a date certain or an amount of days certain mm -hmm. that would be considered, you know, it, it goes into a rational basis test. I think that we are able to 
increase the number of days over seven significantly because we're not a quote unquote beach town, mm -hmm. right? We, we don't have seasonal renters. So, so what we're trying to establish here is different than what Point Pleasant or Belmar was trying to establish. So I believe, yes, 90 days is certainly more defendable than 125 days and what we're not looking for. Um, and, and frankly, I don't think, I think these are all things that will be considered by a court as to determining whether it passes the rational basis test. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it's rational. I think it's rational at 125 days. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to be also a president. president. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the reason for the law. Right. right. So we, we, we have the two cases that are clearly out there. Outright ban, absolutely no way. Seven days passes in a town like Point Pleasant, which relies upon the tourism and the people that are coming into town through, from May through September. So people don't come to, at least I don't know many people that come, you know, I mean, they might come for. Actually, I don't know. It's I don't know any cases. I, I'd so say relatives coming to stay near their family members for a week for graduation or for some kind of wedding or something like that. Well, that would be bad. And that yeah, would I don't be know less than the spirit of what we're, what we're really trying to do. I don't think there's, I don't think that's the market of sure in no. short term rentals. I think those people are staying at the Molly Pitcher medicine. And you know, yeah. yeah. And or staying buy, in the house with them. Then you're not a rent you're a house guest. When you're the buyer of property, for example, if I'm going to purchase a second or third or whatever investment property in Point Pleasant, my expectations are very different than maybe a property I, I might buy from Ferry because they're very different places, which is the point you're making. I'm just set right. the other from the other side. So it's a property on because I it's a property rights issue. Well, that's what the Constitution is. Absolutely. I'm, I'm Absolutely. So your, your rights as a property owner. Different than your rights as a property or your expectations. So, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I do think the 120, I'm comfortable with 125 because I think it is rational because it captures the summer season. Um, I, I, it would be interesting to see if, it, if in some way this sort of disadvantages, it just in some way is a disservice. I think this is in service to. The welfare and livability of our community, and I think our residents would be well served by this as it's in draft. Um, Can I also throw out there, and when we discuss this on Lanius, again, if we if we make a decision here and we need to pivot, and yeah. it's a living document, like we can come back a month later and make another change and fix it and mold it and you know create that piece of play doh that works best. No, and then use food metaphor. <laughs> and it also comes down to an enforcement issue as well. Oh, you know, who's even monitoring or enforcing it? You know, that ordinance. That's you know, it would, it would have to. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, yeah, that's a good point. Like, I write a 125 day lease all the time, and then by the 90th day, they're gone. Like, like that to me. If there is no enforcement of that, you can't you can't enforce that. That's just nobody's gonna know the answer to that. Well, I have this, or is it the advertisement? Yeah, like you you're shutting down the advertisement yeah, of yeah, lower. Yeah. There is there is there are just two sides of the enforcement, right? Yes, there are 12 warnings going out as of today for people that aren't following warnings. It's just what put that out mm -hmm. there that, that is happening. For what? <clears throat> Leave and rush. Oh, okay. Um Specific to this, we need to think through what the penalty is of enforcement. Because if the penalty is a hundred bucks, I believe, that's what it, I believe that's what it is. Though. Uh, they, my, they forfeit their license because there's a registration. Right. But my, my point is with the short term rental, when we find somebody that does it, I think we need to heavily consider a significant fine that would offset any financial benefit of potentially renting out. I mean, that one house that's charging 2100 bucks a night, a night, I don't think yeah. we're able to address that, right? Yeah. But my point is, if we say 100 bucks, and I'm just going off with an anecdote from Deacon Brush, one resident said to the code enforcement, all right, if I made 100 bucks, it's much easier than me carting it off the street back, right? That was the response of the residents of the code enforcement. 
So I think in this instance, I think we need to put some significant thought process into what the repercussion is so that when that enforcement opportunity comes up, it is significant and we'll, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, 4-4.8 4 addresses uh, violations and penalties. First offense being $100 to $250 fine, yeah. $250 fine. Second offense, $500 to $1,000, possible and permit ratification. And then third, uh, $1,000 to $2,000 fine permit shall be revoked. I, I, I believe that your second and third or more offenses are uh, pretty strict. Um, and, and, and frankly, I don't believe you're even allowed to incre increase above $2,000 uh, for, the, for the offense. Um, so the only thing that I would you know, suggest that if, if you don't deem it fits the penalty, you know, fits the crime, here, then you would look at the first offense and the first offense only. Yeah, just take that out. Everything else slides up. Maybe. So you could you could you could increase that fine to two fifty to five hundred. Because I forget, I think you even did like the average dollar, right? It was like two sixty a night, yeah. right? So two sixty a night times seven is fourteen hundred bucks. They get hit with a hundred fine. Fine, I'll let them stay in there. Yeah. I still met it thirteen hundred bucks. They just raised the price on hundred bucks. <laughs> right, that's my point, right? But with the second offense, if the second offense became firm, five hundred two grand is a lot, but possible permit revocation, like. And now we get into some real ramifications that go just beyond a short-term financial hit to potentially longer-term financial implications. And I think we need that there if we want to have changes in behaviors of our ordinances are going to be taken seriously. So I'm good at 90 days. I'm a bit uncomfortable at 140, 125, mainly because I got feedback that we're inviting a lawsuit from somebody who knows the market. And that just makes me uncomfortable. Though I'm not a market guru, so I don't really know. There's no right or wrong answer here. This is all like gray area stuff. I don't think the market should dictate our local laws. Um, I, I, I think the market will respond to our laws. Yeah, I don't think the market should dictate our laws either. I agree with that. Well, I, I'm just concerned. I think, I think, it's I think 90 laws. days might satisfy also what you're looking to do. Um, well, it wouldn't be, well. uh, from my standpoint, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, I hope it wouldn't be 90, I hope it would be 95, just to, you know, throw in those extra... I can get comfortable yeah. with 95. Yeah. I feel like once we get into a longer period, is right. we're <laughs> going to start attracting folks to, to, the, to the issue, and then all of a sudden all the talk and thought that we put into, and effort we put into this goes up in flames, and I don't really know if we get another bite at the apple with this. Well, I think if our attorney says it's defensible, it's a rational piece of legislation. And, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> let me, let me, I don't know if he is. <laughs> sure. Let me, let, me, let me ask this question to everyone up here. Are, are you all comfortable with, um, after this meeting, me working with Attorney Sobel, maybe following up on some of the feedback that you got, mm -hmm. maybe looking into it a little bit more, and wherever we land, 95 or 125, does that work for everyone? Based on what what we think is best, I'm good with that. I'm, I'm a proponent yeah. of bumping up the offense, mm -hmm. and then as long as Mr. Nichesny's comments from the last meeting are addressed, I'm good. Yep, you do realize it has the borough administrator. I'm failing the appeal. I, I don't I don't see any. Can I can I can I can I also offer that we have the right at the end of the day to approve or not approve? You know, somebody getting this permit or license, correct? So. You know, we, we, there is a governing, there, there's going to be a process around which we allow this to happen or we don't, correct? For each person that tries that, to submit well, a permit. So, so to that point, the appeal process, did you want to go to the governing body? She's talking about a permitting process, not an appeal process. I'm talking I, about the appeal process. I don't think so. I believe we should. <laughs> what, what did you say? Administrator. I believe the administrator should be. Hearing the appeals on Hearing that? the appeals. They shouldn't come to the last Okay. I'll prove her then we'll just move on. <laughs> 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 Humor. Actually, I think, I think the purpose of that is actually to slow the process down. But, but they, can, can, the governing body, can the governing body get a heads up on those appeals? Like just as an FYI, we had a couple of appeals. I think it's important for us to know when they're coming in. I guess what that's we'll, we'll, let's discuss we that. Can play that. We'll, we'll talk about that. Okay. You know where we're at? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to move forward to the draft non domestic animal ordinance. Oh,
Um, I just had a couple quick questions as a follow up to what <clears throat> Attorney Sobel was mentioning about sort of due process and um, you know the rational basis test. That, you know, my question is: I think this this ordinance is, is straightforward and to the point. I you know legally, do we have the right, given these are private properties, to to have you know um, I guess a, a law that prohibits people having non-domestic animals on their property. Just, just, and the only reason I'm thinking about this is because what Andrew, you know, uh, Andrew Sobel just mentioned. Just I'm all for it. I just wanted to ask the question. <clears throat> you, don't see, you don't see any concerns. I don't see any concerns. Okay. Any other questions? No, it helps address public health, safety, and welfare. That's, that's our jurisdiction. That's why we elected and that's mm -hmm. what we're for. And, and to that end, should we be also in looking about increasing the fines from 100, you know, 100 in the first to 500 and subsequent? Similar to Drew's point about short-term rentals. Okay, so the only the only question I have is 5-18.4. You guys on the back last page? I just want to make sure everyone understands that that is allowing them to renew for one more year. The way that reads, and I know there was some conversation last time about this is a public I health issue potentially. Okay. I mean, based on the feedback, if this, if we're if we're assessing that it is a public health emergency, critical issue, how we want to qualify it, I think exacerbating that for the next fourteen months, to me, that's counterintuitive. Right, it'd be like yeah. I agree. The black, black mold issue, like you, 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 if you have the issue, why exacerbate it? I don't know what the solution is. I, do I think it's a cease and desist? No. Do I think there needs to be time to allow for the proper handling, transitioning? I don't know what you call it of the non-domestic. I do, but I think exacerbating this for 14 months is counter to it being classified. If we collectively assess it is a public health. Oh, Concern. Allison, right. how many permits are out there right now? Two. Two. One has is up for renewal in June. The other is September. Right, but the one that is up for renewal in June is the one that we've been talking about. That there's an okay. issue. Okay. I mean, I'm on the same camp as Councilman La Barbera. I, I don't see why we would do that here. And if you, I'll give them thirty days beyond, uh, you know, one other something. Is that a reasonable amount of time for them to? To move them before we make before we answer that one other data point that did come up with the residents that were impacted they talked about it being worse in the winter time right, right. If i recall correctly yes. so, if anybody yeah. calls, right? so you know maybe we give them 60 days you know 90 days 95 starting <laughs> i would say i would say by september 30th i like it i would recommend mr mayor by september 30th they're out I, I, I 60 days is probably fine. I I know I got we we all got yelled at for making light of this, and I didn't. That's not the point here. Um, I do think that there is a good unwind period. It's it's not as impactful during the summer months. 60 days is probably enough. Yeah. Well, I believe when we had the situation with the license on River Road, and he doubled his chicken count, you gave him 30 days to renew, mm -hmm. which he did. I just don't, I mean, I, I don't want to say anything adversely happened to the animals. Not like, and so, you know, if, if the residents who are directly impacted are letting us know that the winter months were the worst, the end of September, it's still 85 degrees and hot. That provides ample time for the non domestics to be relocated. It gives us ample time because we're going to have to write, finalize this, then approve it. It's got to be implemented, all that. By the time that happens, it's the middle of the end of June. So it's two, three months max that the, the two the two residents we're talking about at 6,200 will have to relocate the moment. Labor Day? Labor Day? I'm going to say that's too long, you think? I think it's generous. You still need mm -hmm. this, Julie. I know. It, yeah. it, 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 I'm uncomfortable giving them a little bit of time. Well, we still, we're not passing this tonight. Right. So when's the next meeting? June 12th. 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 12th.
You could give them June 26th. Is this, but this isn't even considered well, introduction. One renewal is June, one yeah. renewal is September. Say there'll be no renewals and they'll have so many days to relocate When's the animals. When, 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 Sorry, and it's from counting from the date to amend the ordinance. When's the 26th? Yes, it's, from, it's 60 it's, days from the date of the ordinance being signed. Yes. Because I, I think, think that's that's 60, 60 days from June 26 is basically way better. Do we not do we not have the right to, to not renew the permit based on the health and safety of the residents yeah. that we've heard from and then offer up a period of time in which they need to have an evacuation plan or transfer plan, whatever it may be, by September 30th? Well, because it's September 4th, 60 days, right? Because the, the one that renews on September, that is on September 5th or August. August. Twenty second. Maybe that's one. Maybe maybe the day it, it expires is the day we yep. September twenty second. I think there need. I, I think there should be a hard line. We're going to say by Labor right. Day, no more domestics in Fairhaven, irrespective of what the permits say. Now I don't know from an ordinance and legal perspective how we can do that. Does that work? Well, because one of them is up for re renewal in June. June. We're not going to renew it. Okay. And one's up for renewal in September. So the one that's when it's not up for renewal, okay. we don't renew it. How does that work? Do they immediately have to get rid of theirs? No, there would, there would have to be some sort of uh, lag time in order for them to comply with the ordinance. Right. That's what. I, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. But the issue is, right? If we don't, if we don't approve the ordinance, let's say we approve the ordinance on June twenty sixth, and the resident comes for renewal on June twenty fifth, there is no ordinance governing why they're denied. Correct. Does, does the exception language in here allow the option to deny them the renewal? Because we have to go off what our ordinance says. We can't go off what we think the ordinance is going to say. Our existing ordinance prohibits these animals. But there's an exception. Which is simply the prerogative of this body right. to, to offer them a permit. So it comes back to us. It comes back to us. And because we have ample evidence of a public health concern. So, so that one's not getting approved. What about the other one in September? Because right. if we, if we, so if we decide no more domestics on August first, non-domestics, right. non-domestics, non -domestic. non -domestic. Non -domestic. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> be careful. But but <laughs> we have a permit that extends right. so, past that. Well, no, you wouldn't be able to do an early termination of that permit unless they. I think there's a second. Failed. That there's a what? For, if there's We've had issues with that property as well. Oh, well then, then if it didn't, doesn't comply with the ordinance and they're in violation of their permit, you know, I, don't think they're, I don't think they're in violation anymore. Uh, they were in violation. They fixed the violation and we approved them. Even if we gave them until end of October. Well, I can send them the ordinance. Like, hey. I, I go to September 27th. Why don't we do that? Let, let me let me look into this. You know, I don't want to talk about any particular case in depth because then it goes into you know potential litigation. Okay. Um, let me consider because it's the one in September that's the issue. Okay. Okay. Can, can we can we have that addressed at the June twelfth? Yes. Meeting? Can we still do an introduction on the next mm -hmm. meeting? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Great. Moving along. This is public comment on agenda items only. Uh, please say identify yourself by clearly stating your name and address for the record. Please try to observe a time limit of three minutes. Uh, this is for agenda items only. Is there anyone in the public agenda item only? Allison, is there anyone on Zoom? All right. Okay, moving along. Approval of minutes, May 2023, regular and executive sessions. And I have a motion to approve. Motion. Second. Second. Councilman, please, <laughs> okay. please have a roll call. Council members, call. Yes. Howie? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Harvey? Yes. yes. And, and Mr. Mayor, just a quick plug, like, Allison, thank you for putting this together. I know they're extremely laborious. I read them every time, and I just appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. We have uh, old business, public hearing on the 2023 municipal budget. Uh, do I have a motion, motion to open it? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Is there anyone in the public that uh, 
would like to make a public comment on the 2023 municipal budget. Allison, you want to zoom? No, sir. Do I have a motion to close? Motion. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Uh, moving on to borough facilities update. All right, I'm going to stand up. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, if I, if I may, I just want to make a quick comment before I get into it. I, I wrote down two notes here. Um, I just wanted to give thanks to the governing body, to the borough, and to the public. Um, I go back to our January 9th meeting where we talked about the trust and rebuilding trust, and, and I think we've done a really phenomenal job getting back there. Um, and as we talked about the last governing body meeting with this pre-qualification process, that's probably given us maybe three to four weeks, conservatively six, uh, planning for worst case scenario. It almost gives us time to breathe and self-reflect a little bit. So I just wanted to say thank you. I don't know if you have anything you want to add, but it's been pretty spectacular. I, I, I would echo the sentiments of Councilman La Barbera, and that goes for everyone up on the dais. It goes for all the professionals, all, all the, the uh, higher vendors as well. Um, we walked in tonight, you know, before you leave, you want to take a look at what's on the table and just imagine how many hours of work went into getting to the point where we're at. Um, it's a really special uh, job that's been done. And um, I thank you, Councilman La Barbera, along with Councilwoman Hoey and the Facilities Committee for getting us here. This is the drawings for the Yeah, it's actually complete. Um, we have a lot of review ahead of us in the next couple of weeks, but they're there. Um, so we want to bring up the PowerPoint. Um, and I just want to make sure that we can. Councilman Hobie, you can see that on your screen, right? Just a quick check. Okay, awesome. All right, so this is the update. Um, I'm going to start on DPW. Um, this is a updated schedule. The asterisks symbolize an update. The pre-qualifying bidders um, has required us to shuffle our schedule slightly. Um, if anything, for DPW, it will give us more time, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, and initially, because we need a special governing body meeting for the pre-qualification process, I'll get to that in a few minutes, um, we wanted to follow all the best practices of the police department, open houses, shifting from phases with governing body approval, et cetera. Um, we have some work to do with selecting the contractor. Um, I got to circle up with, with, with uh, Sobel and, and Greg just on um, reviewing the contracts when they come in. So, so we have some work here, but nonetheless, our alignment with these projects happen at the same time, uh, optimizing the economies of scale with our owners rep, we're still agreeing with that. Um, so quick update. Next slide. Okay, open house one feedback. So we had our first open house uh, this past Saturday. Next one is Wednesday the 31st, 5 30 p.m. in here. Um, I wanted to kind of spend some time here. So as we had discussions with residents, you, you, it became really clear that there's four pillars to the, DP, the success of the DPW project. And really it comes down to balancing the design, the operational management, enforcement, and education. So it's kind of like four pillars that, that, that no matter how you discuss the DVW project, really what it boils down to. And all of these have, I'm not going to say equally weighted, but an equal part ensuring that whatever is the renovation includes, these other pillars all have to come together to really give us a solid project. Um, there are really three main components um, that we talked through, reducing the impact of an industrial site and residential area. Then we get into how do we insulate that area? And then um, I think this is V2. Is this V1? Alle and alleviate um, the recycling center pain point is what we're calling it. That, that, that's really a crux of it. This is V2. Okay, awesome. There's some key themes that came out of it, uh, out of the open house. One, and I'm going to show you option two site plan. So there are two site plans, one of the current DPW footprint, and then one reducing the footprint by over 6,000 square. It was fairly unanimous, reducing the size of the DPW footprint was preferred. This one was interesting, an eight foot fence is preferred. Um, and the residents that lived around me, but we talked about pre-Sandy days, how when the fence was eight foot, it actually offered additional buffer. 
So that was really insightful and helpful to help us because we were oscillating between six, seven, and eight foot. So the fact that there was previous anecdotes, previous um, um, successful mitigation via the fence was really helpful. Um, the landscaping improvements, everybody was really stoked about that. Um, specific to the fences, <clears throat> so what we did was we gave three different material types, metal, wooded stone, stone, wood, actually four. Um, and what we ruled out unanimously was no opening in the fences. So like no vertical slats, no horizontal slats. Where folks unanimously landed was some combination of wooded stone. What that is, we don't know yet. We're gonna now have design iterations on that. We'll go to the next open house. Um, when it came down to the exterior of the DPW building, I was shocked there wasn't more conversation here. Mm -hmm. Residents were really honed in on recycling. Um, and it wasn't just people that live around there. Um, but the feedback we did get, stone and horizontal siding was the preference, um, which was interesting. Um, there was one comment, and I wanted to highlight this, the front door of the DPW show would be half glass. And then the recycling center requires another iteration. Um, so for open house two, again, 31 May, 5.30 PM in here, um, we're going to have some additional iterations. We will include, just like we did with PD Community Center, what the previous iteration was. So we can demonstrate the growth and, and help the conversation. Um, but we're already beginning to discuss potential recycling center iterations and what that looks like, balancing cost and design. Uh, Woodstone combination fence options, and then I'm calling them four-sided elevations, capturing three different types of stones and hardy plank slash vinyl. As far as like visual, hardy plank and vinyl look fairly similar. It's really the material and there's maintenance considerations and whatnot that go into cost considerations. So I'm going to talk about them interchangeably. Um, ultimately, where we land, it's, it's, it's going to come down to maintenance, it's going to come down to cost. Um, but we got some really great feedback. If you go to the next slide, just so everybody can see, this was um, the preferred site plan. So the area on the left, that's the 6,000 plus square reduction in the size of the footprint. Now I wanna clarify because a resident called me up in a really good way. They, they said, Are, you're not reducing the lot size. No, we're not touching the lot size. We're not saying DPW's an acre now, we're gonna get three quarter acre. What we're saying is, is that the, the, the size of the industrial operation is being reduced by over 6,000 square. So I want to be really discerning that. Did you get a sense for what the concern was about that question? Um, it had to do, so I'm doing the research. It had to do with impact to the Hendrickson, the five lots over here. Um, and then Iron Cruel was providing an education on the affordability housing analysis. Um, there was, that, that's really what it's centered on. Okay, I understand. Yeah, I got it. Yep. Thanks. Um, so this is, I mean, really, we huddled around this for probably a solid hour. Um, and as residents came in, they just constantly piled on all the other exhibits really had. People looked, they provided feedback and comments, but this was the crux of it. Um, next slide. Okay, so here's some updates. Um, DKWN facility. So there's a new link on the borough website that centralizes all documentation in a clear, concise manner presentations, assessments, cost estimates, you name it, it's up there. I'm probably overkilling how much information's out there. Um, but I've had quite a few residents say, hey, it's hard to find your presentation from this date. It's hard to find X, it's hard to find them all. Um, there's also gonna be a, 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 an FAQ. And so residents can ask questions and we'll kind of evolve that. Because as the project commences, it's gonna be another communication lever that we pull, one of many that we're gonna be doing. Uh, planning board, I went on 16 May, provided kind of a status update similar to what I do with PD and Community Center. Extremely appreciative. Highlighted the TDRC coming up on 6 June. Highlighted the uh, capital review we're targeting at the 20 June uh, planning board meeting. Great discussion, great conversation. Probably was upwards of seven minutes, give or take. Uh, pre qualified bidders, so just requesting some feedback and direction. So the initial discussions with the team was. Pre-qualifying for competing communities so it makes sense, the scope, the scale, et cetera. For this, this is really boils down to some renovation, some site work. So the thought process was, do we really need to pre-qualify for this job? Um, and I'm really looking for a direction from the governing body with what we want to do. Um, hmm. I don't know if there's any initial thoughts. Uh, I think I'll just pause here. Is it the question. same three to four week delay? 
I, I wouldn't call it a delay, it adds three to four weeks. We would manage the schedule in such a way to do so. Um, Our thought was that it, it was more a renovation project than a new construction project, so it's a different type of a contractor. And many of those contractors might not have pre-registered or gone through uh, you know, the state to um, be listed as someone who meets certain criteria. Because for PD Community Center, we're specifically going off of the state website where these contractors have to apply and they have to have certain thresholds and dollar amounts of buildings that they can Right. So I, the question is, does pre-qualifying for this hurt us right. in such a way because it's it's not a brand new Butler building and we're not expanding the site, you know, it, that was the thought process. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I know, but I do want direction as a team, as a group, because if so, then we'll adjust the, the schedule in such a way where we're not going to feel it, quote unquote, like we're feeling it right now. So I, I welcome guidance, uh, you know. I think it's just a phone, right? Yeah. I mean, I imagine if something. Yeah, I'd love to say no, but like then I'm thinking about yeah, what if something goes happens. wrong and we go back to this point and we could have yeah. just taken the extra step to. For the amount, and I'm not trying to sway you one way or the other, you just have to take a hard look at that. Um, I, I believe we already sent it out, but the document from the state that lists the limits of what the contractors qualify for, I don't think is any of them are, are necessarily as low as this project is, is going to come in at when it comes to the cost estimates. I mean, they, we were talking, you know, we're, we're looking at You mean we're not going to find people 12. to pre-qualify? Is that what you mean? Well, that we'll have more people to bid on this if we don't go with the pre-bid. That's a possibility. Correct. But the only issue is mm -hmm. you're stuck with the lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. that that's, that's, that's the risk for us. We know that doesn't always work. I don't think we've already been there. I wouldn't, I would not take a If that's the direction we want to go, we'll adjust accordingly. I just want... Yeah, we don't need consensus. We can do a straw poll to see where we stand. Do like, we have this a decision point right now? I, okay. I, 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 I would prefer to have this right now, given that we're this far ahead of the schedule where we can plan accordingly. Yes. I, I agree with Councilwoman Neff 100%. We've come this far, no risk. There's no point in risking it. We've come so far. You've done so much work through. Like, why, why risk it at this point? The, I think what I'm hearing is the risk is financial risk. I think is that accurate? Not, is we, we might not we might um, there could be vendors potentially that won't go through the process because the job isn't big enough for them. Yeah. So now you have a smaller subset of contractors that are that are willing to bid on the job, um, quality or not quality. Either way, you have a smaller subset, so you have less you know opportunities for lower lower bids. Did, did we get feedback at all from uh, from uh, yeah, you know, our professionals with what they thought as far as pre qualification but on this job? Yeah, we didn't speak to Ron Grammer. I don't what, what, yeah, what about uh, the Fergusons? Do they have any uh, Fergusons are all about managing risk? They would tell you pre qualified. It's a reputational risk for the borough. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, something happens along the way. I right? agree. Yeah, the, the, the contractor and the people are going through. I agree. You know, you. like the people living around the construction site. Okay. Do we pay another six months? The, the risk of a bad job, not only from a financial standpoint, but from a, you know, that's let's see. And you have to ask yourself what from, number you want to use then. What 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 kind of? We already know what we used for PD and and uh, community center. You know, as far as what criteria they have to meet. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I, you know, do you want to you want to leave it at ten or twelve million dollars? I don't know if the people that big are going to bid on this job. So small. And if we drop, you know, maybe we'll look at it with, you know, take another look at it. But I, I don't have the expertise to say if we drop it four million dollars. I don't recall seeing that aggregate amount. Um, Rich, do you have any uh, feedback on this? The necessity to qualify? Um, the only thing is, I'm not too, I'm not familiar with what you guys have been doing with this pre qualification. I haven't been part of that process, but 
This is a totally different type project. It's strictly a renovation. It's not a new building. Um, I just, I, I guess I get worried what we've already learned recently, but also I just see people around town like they do renovations and they sit there and they're like, my contract is up. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, I don't see why this would be any different. I've had past experience in other towns where we've done renovation projects and you are stuck with the lowest responsible bidder when you bid it traditionally. And it's a little bit, bit problematic. That's our answer. So with, if, if, if all three of them then are part of, all three projects are part of this, is it potential to attract one contractor? No, because they're being bidded separately. Okay. We would just go, we would just repeat the pre-qualification process okay. with DPW. I mean, all the line of the schedule, and it sounds like that's what we're leaning for. So we want to pre-qualify, we can work with Ron, come up with the requirements, and then we'll Hopefully, follow our normal course of GP meetings. Tracy, I know you're not suggesting we put these projects together. It's <laughs> definitely, definitely not. You didn't hear me say that. <laughs> cool. All right. Pre qualify. Yeah, Ask everyone. I, I think um, so. What, what's your, uh, you've been in the weeds more than anybody here on this particular issue. Where, where are you? So I can, I'll speak from my background, right? My background with projects, and this is small. But my background is to mitigate risk as much as you can. There's so much out of our control. And we can get insurance with the GIF. We can do builder's insurance. We can do that, 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 bond insurance, all these things. And they're great. We want to pull as many risk management levers as we can. So I'm for pre-qualifying. I have. They put the pipe roll on the roof. It doesn't, you know, the exhaust goes the wrong way. You know, and listen, know. we can pre-qualify and we get it done. Right, I mean, there's, there's, there's no guarantee, but you just stack more things in your favor. It's more work. It's going to be more meetings. We'll be able to absorb it to the schedule as of now. But you know, you got to remember the the renovation cost the DPW was like three. What was it? The new Boulder building was four point four. It was the third less. What's the third? Four point four. One point two. So the renovation was three point two. That was our assessment that Brian Mead did based on. Goldstein partnership, right? So I don't have an updated number yet because we're not at the design. We can't initiate mm -hmm. the cost estimate, but $3.2 million is a lot of money. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're not a town of 500,000, we're a town of 6,000, and that's a lot of money for us. Yeah. It is. So that's where I stand. But again, I, did, I, I don't want to make that type, that level of decision on my own. We've done every detail. Let's continue to check, check. That doesn't mm -hmm. sound like there's a downside. Mm -hmm. Well, the only no downside is precluding potential. I'm going to call the mom and pop renovators who do exceptional work sure. from a plumber. That 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 is and the potential downfall. Is there a scenario under which this is so small that we don't even get some possible? Oh, that's a possible. Yep. Well then. But again, that comes down, I think, to the dollar limit. I think we can do to to Teresa. I think we do like further research and requirements. Work with Ron. Okay. Um, there are resources in town that have requested or recommended to help. And if we have questions, I say we go to those resources and ask them what their experience has been. I know you know a few people, I know you know a few people, I know a few people, right? I know all of us do. So I think we rely on our team here, our, our team. He knows a guy, I know a guy that knows a guy. All right, cool, helpful. Uh, Freehold's Freehold Soil Convert uh, Conversation District. We're going to have to go to the Freehold, uh, to Freehold, because we're going to be disturbing more than 5,000 square feet, just a hard pass rule. Uh, stormwater management. Um, we have uh, an initial plan of how to handle stormwater management at the DPW site. There are going to be improvements. We are balancing this. The extent of the site work dictates how much stormwater management we have to do. Um, and we're going to make sure we take care of all the storm, Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, we're going to take care of all the stormwater runoff from the DPW building itself, which right now is non existent. Mm -hmm. And then there's a stormwater management area of concern, AOC, specific to a catch basin that we're going to be addressing as well. So the site is going to be, I, I would qualify Rich as significantly improved from site water, stormwater management perspective. Uh, risk assessments. So I, I'm a managing risk, just putting the data point out there. I don't know where it lands yet, but our risk manager assessed not having residential vehicles operate on the site, i.e. specific to if we wanted to have a <clears throat> parking lot for recycling is not advised. Mm -hmm. So just putting that data point out there. Construction official, like we did PD Community Center, working with Fabiano, 
um, comment came in today uh, that Rich and I were on where Nick was already providing assessments and <coughs> feedback to the drawings and everything. Awesome. So already working uh, and support us. All the, if you guys recall, um, we were gonna do selected site demolition at DPW, all that's been done. So basically walls and ceilings were open so that when the engineers go now on Friday, they'll be able to really see the condition behind the walls to determine the full extent of the renovation. Uh, so great job, I mean, guys did a phenomenal job on that. Temporary trailer space, we're gonna have an on-site meeting with mobile lease modular space um, to, to get these guys out. If you recall correctly, right? The roof sequencing in such a manner not to avoid rework and redesign. That means potentially getting the DPW team out earlier. We're gonna do an on-site meeting. It's probably gonna be a double wide uh, trailer. All well, everything that would need to be compliant, but we're working through that. Um, next slide. So as far as next steps, um, we're gonna hit some of the key ones, right? We have our next open house. We have the TDRC. Uh, we're meeting with BFI tomorrow, mm -hmm. so we can start furniture programming on that. Um, we're going to get two more state contracts that should have been apologies for the fuel tanks, like we talked about. We'll submit the American Water Fire Suppression. Um, so these are just some of the, the, the key items that we'll address because our next meeting is not until 12 June, so we have quite a bit of time between now and then. Cool. All yeah, right. Good. Next slide. We're almost there. Okay, so pre qualified bidders, I'm not going to hit this. It'll be on the website. You guys. You know, have it in email. Um, basically, we're working to meet the pre qualification process. Um, we have a resolution tonight. Um, Alice and Teresa worked wonders to get the public notices out. There's a 24 day lead time for public notices or 20? 20 day lead time. And so at the 12 May meeting, we'll have a public hearing. 12 June. 12 June, sorry. 12 June, we'll have a public hearing meeting. And then we're going to have a special governing body meeting on Zoom on the 19th to approve the minutes. And then we're working with DLGS and DCA behind the scenes so that once we have the 19 June approval, we submit the application because all these things have to be done beforehand and DL DLGS comes in. Um, and we'll get to authorization of it and all that with time in a little bit. We were supposed to authorize the bid tonight, but we pushed that off because it just didn't make sense to yet. Uh, next uh, slide. I really wanted to drive this point home, right? Because I think it's important for the governing body and more so for the public to demonstrate how it, it's a priority for us to get this done swiftly, but not at the detriment of doing it wrong, right? And I think we showed that not only with our open houses and our communications and how much information out there, but, is, but even with our pre-qualification. And the pre-qualifying bidders is actually a great inflection point. I wanted to hit a few items here. Um, we have... Two, that two dozen sets of eyes on these drawings as of last Friday. 24 plus people looking at the construction documents, looking for inconsistencies, you name it, not to mention our owner's rep, right? Um, and everybody has them. You, everybody should have got the Dropbox link on Friday. Everybody has what I have. I'm gonna take these home tonight, page turn myself tomorrow. If anybody wants them after that, I'll be more than happy to pass them off. Um, We'll get, we'll get further updates from appropriations committee. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, finalized parking agreements with Fish Chapel, the memorial, updated cost estimate. This is a big piece. You can't authorize for bid until you have the updated cost estimate, which is based on the construction documents because we have to be authorized to a certain amount. So we'll have the updated cost estimates on 2 June. The ordinances are updated and they're preparing bid that. So again, going back to my initial sentiment at the beginning about the trust and all that, you know, we were trusted to run fast. And now we're also being able to discern and run a little bit slower just to allow certain things to uh, marry. Next slide. Updates. It seems like a lot. I did one or two. I really did that because it was hard to read the small font. Um, substantially complete drawings. Again, two dozen plus people have those drawings as of now. We won't public, publish the drawings. It's guidance from Department of Corrections and other that you don't want your finalized police station layout available for public consumption. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of what changed. Um, and I'm not gonna give any hints as that. We, we can talk. Um, American Water met with them. They're gonna upgrade the Fifth Street Main um, in Q4. Uh, we have, we're putting some alternate language in the construction documents should a fire pump be required. We don't know yet. We won't know because until the main's upgraded, we can't, we, we need to then perform an updated hydrant flow test and model flow test. So it's planning for the worst, hoping for the best. 
as opposed to not putting them there and then we come back and hey surprise we need a water pump i'd rather say hey we might need a water pump it's going to be good as an alternate if we don't then we don't have to do it um construction sign another governing body inflection point so goldstein partnership recommends a construction sign outlining key stakeholders so we really looked at that and how we how the team wanted to to, to move forward is really relevant information about the contractor and contact information. That's it. To me, the, the construction sign, it's, it's, not a, a, it's not an advertising for the contractor. It's, hey, here, here's the project, here's the key people. If you have an issue, this is who you call. So if the governing body is cool with that, I would like to move forward with that approach. Okay, great. Uh, cornerstone and plaque. All right, I'm revisiting this. Um, cornerstone, yes, check, check on the police department, no big deal. The way the design of the community center is with the site and everything, there's not a clear area for the cornerstone. Separate from that, based on my research, Goldstein Partnership, and the team, having one memorial plaque is kind of the standard and best practice. So I know last time we said no plaque, um, but I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't raise it again. I think it is, I, I think it's best to have the plaque put at the community center, have, have it erected, and, and, and I wanted to revisit it here. What does the flag say? Um, just one up the stairs, just the building. Yeah, yeah, I should have put it here. Standard. On this date, this 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 building was uh, erected. Uh, this was the governing body that was there or authorized it when it was erected. Here, who is designed it? Um, um, I think all of that. It's I'm just I'm going off the standard, right? We looked here when we went to Colts Neck PD, it was there. When we went to Union Beach PD, it was there. We have one now. We have one now at the at the police station. I'm comfortable with the in the community center and the date. I agree with you. I yes. also think that there's um, if we're going to do any kind of memorials, I think we should memorialize what what the uh, community center and the police department were, as mm -hmm. opposed to a lot of back padding for Eli and, and whoever the construction engineer was. I, I could care less about that. So two pieces. We, we've Thanks. been planning for the memorial of what the site was, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, right, I've been tracking that since January. And Pat Drummond actually did her site assessment we talked about the last meeting. And it's really not about um, it's not about giving kudos to someone, right? It, it's just about the process. And again, we don't need to approve what the content is. So the way I, what I articulated to Eli was, hey, if the government agrees to the plaque and we work on the content later, then the content should be decided by here, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody else. So if we're agreeing to put a plaque in the community center, check, check, we can take that back. It's literally like, you know, I don't know, 12 by 18. Mm -hmm. And then the actual content itself, we can get a couple versions and get some government for review. If that's how we want to proceed. Uh, yeah, I had spoken to Councilwoman President Koch, and um, you know, in passing, we were like, we don't, we don't really need a plaque, but I don't want to speak for her. She's not here today. I don't really see a need for it personally. Uh, but we're gonna. I don't also don't want to take too much time talking about it. If we're gonna do it. Let's just do it. But I just don't want to talk about it a long time. There's so many other more. <laughs> I think about. we need to name it. It's the Prairie Co Community Center. I'm comfortable with some type of plaque with the content is with three back versions here. You guys are cool with that. Oh, sure sure. Okay. Uh, BFI meeting then tomorrow. DOC got a verbal green light. Met with the Department of Corrections on Friday. Um, minor and really the one primary piece of feet, there's two primary pieces of feet. Remove a door yeah. and then uh, make sure locks are consistent with how the DOC approaches juvenile detention. I'll leave it at that. If there's any additional discussions that we want to have, we can have an executive session discussion to talk about those components. Uh, the formal letter takes a very long time, but we got what we needed from them. Chief, I don't know if they were great. No, they were great. Yeah, Cool. Uh, cost estimate, you will have an updated cost estimate for the project, right? So the way the AIA works at each stage of the program, you get an updated cost estimate. Now we're, now we're at pretty much 100% complete drawings. You should have an updated cost estimate, not only to inform what the budget is, but it's also to make sure that you have enough funding authorized. And this last piece, I, I want to put this in here. I'm, I'm working on an updated cost estimate. I'll have more once Ron Grammer does DPW. For every million dollars we save, not only do we save a million dollars in principal, but it's 445k over the life of the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna come back to that. I'll keep coming back to that. We'll have a whole finance discussion on what it was and what it is now. Next slide. Uh, Fish Chapel met with them on Monday on Friday. 
uh, gave them the draft agreements, the draft scope of work. They're going to noodle through, hopefully meet this week. Um, I'm going to come back to this site survey um, because I have to raise it here. Uh, the acoustics report, as we've done throughout this entire process, and we'll DPW, right? We like to have gut checks, right? We like to go to different professionals and gut check. Our spidey senses went up on the community center acoustics. So we pulled our acoustic consultant lever in the design that we approved. They conducted an assessment and they identified a myriad of recommendations to make sure the community center was acoustically friendly. Mm -hmm. If you recall correctly, Chester Field mentioned how the current design that it wasn't acoustically friendly. They needed little sound machines outside to drown out noise. We did not want to end up there. So that report should be disseminated. It'll be made available, um, but we're really happy about that. Uh, Bond and Finance Council just uh, did some components here. Um, 20 years of useful life. Uh, we can't charge the offsite church parking. That'll be capital. But the offsite improvements at DPW, which are going to be the sidewalk, are acceptable because it's a right of way component. Teresa has more background on it. We're going to mildly tweak that ordinance to uh, take the one from, I believe it was 2020, 15, and um, actually put language in there that it would uh, include the community center and borough hall because they were the early ordinances, but not that late ordinance. Mm -hmm. And with at the time that we passed that ordinance, we weren't thinking about a community center. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, she's going to drop that and we'll have an intro for the next thing. Um, community center program, if, if, if the government recalls the defining the community center program, we had a draft and circulated a couple months ago. We then handed that to DJ Director Parks and Rec to mull over, finalize the meeting Wednesday with him. Um, hopefully, that gets to the level we want. We'll pass that to the governing body for, next, for, for consumption, consumption on 12 June. Appropriations, so projects are starting to, starting to come out of appropriations. Um, the projects don't mean pure cut, but what um, our representatives in Cologne's office are saying does look like some of the funding was cut. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's gonna happen to us, but just literally copy and paste what they said. We'll continue to monitor. From what they stated last time is, all the, pro the, the goal of the legislation is that all the projects that are going to be selected are selected before Memorial Day, because that is the deadline in order to submit the bill for approval from Biden in whatever time frame, September. I don't know, though, how the debt ceiling in those conversations impact that, so it's a little wild card. Okay, 33 Fifth and 66 Maple. Met with 33 Fifth Street, went great. It's a one, one foot encroachment of their fence on the PD. We're gonna, we have to redo most of that landscape in any way, and we have to redo the fence and we'll take care of that for that. The only request Beverly had was, please just let me know when you're doing this, because I have dogs and don't want them out. Easy. 66 Maple, <laughs> this one's gonna be interesting. So we are still reconciling site surveys, but it looks like at the front of the fence, there's a potential eight foot encroachment on the church, and the back part of the fence, potentially 15 foot, which is significant. Now, there's a lot of reconciliation. I'm praying that that is wrong, that someone's at the map wrong somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm enlisting the help of the mayor, me, him, and chief. Once we know the numbers and everything, we're going to go knock on 66 mm -hmm. A little bit of a prayer ball. I wasn't thinking this would be that good. Generator. Um, so the current generator at PD and Community Center is three phase, bicentennial hall is two phase. So we can't use it. Mm -hmm. Good news is, though, if we were to trade in the current generator PD community center, we would literally, the money we would get would literally offset the cost of a new two-phase generator for Bicentennial Hall. Um, so Chief is working um, with the, the generator contractor. It won't be part of the bid for the PD community center, it'll be part of Secret City. So basically we'll tie off the current generator and then we'll make sure that we're ready to put the generator by Centennial Hall. We need to work with the store for preservation. I know you sent the email. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've heard back from them yet, but we have time. So yeah. it'll be good. Next slide. So here's next steps. Again, big print just to help. Um, I'm going to hit some of the, the, the key ones. Um, I always will come back to asbestos and abatement. There's some additional investigation um, that's going to go on there. Um, The Fish Chapel, so the Fish Chapel, we gave us some suggestions for the memorial. So Pat Drummond, she did the uh, site significance. Um, and so the memorial will be erected by the flagpole. So once uh, Fish Chapel comes with some suggestions, we're gonna, we're gonna come to a consensus on what the memorial will look like, and then we will focus on what the content will be, similar to the plaque. 
might, you know, if we get into the weeds and flag, that might impact the ability to get the memorial finalized. But we'll find some happy meeting there. We'll bring that here. I'm hoping on 12G. Um, and next, I'm just going to get the name ones just for sake of time since it's 10 o'clock. Uh, finish boards and keep tracking. Um, track appropriation, 66 days we hit. Next slide. And the last one is our schedule. So we completed all our efforts here. Um, we originally we were targeting today, discovering body authorized the bid. We pushed that to 12 June um, to give ourselves a myriad of time based on everything you saw. Any feedback you guys have on the construction documents, question you have, just forward to my wife. Take care of them. What we're going to start doing now with the owner's reps, especially as we get the new cost estimate, remember, O2 June is really understanding what all the different cost components look like. So some of this should collapse shortly. Um, a lot of this is contingent on the contract that we select, how quickly they can mobilize. But as far as we have, we'll do some additional refinement here as we get closer and closer. Um, and that's why we're, you know, we, we bought some time with pre-qualifying for bidders, but that's why we're still doing a special governing body meeting because we, we need to break ground before the fall. We don't want to get a winner with our luck pool soon. <laughs> this last one I did. Um, next slide. I think that's it. Yeah, that's good. So that's everything. So light from a decision point, but a lot of good stuff going on. Any questions? Good job. Good job. Okay. Uh, moving along, new business. Council committee reports, starting with finance. Councilwoman Neff. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's nothing beyond uh, here. The municipal budget that was. We had a public hearing today. Um, we're going to be meeting this week. I think there'll be more to report um, the next time we meet. Uh, unless, Tristan, you want to say anything? I think we're still working on the financing and understanding what the cost to be over 10, 20 years uh, for the residents um, you know, as we move forward with the DPW uh, and police station and community center buildings. So I think that's that's the key item. Uh, you know, is there anything else? No, that's, for now. Thank you. that's pretty much it. I just wanted to mention that I see that there are some representatives of the National Fields uh, um, Area Committee here. Um, I, maybe they will make some comments at, uh, at the uh, uh, you know open at the end of the our meeting. But um, we had a great meeting um, in um, this past month, and I just wanted to mention that I think maybe uh, the council should look a little uh, further into the resources and support that is given to the uh, natural area committee. Um, I just, I think there is a potentially a misalignment between efforts, number of hours invested by the volunteers um, in the natural area committee um, compared to maybe some of our, our commissions and how much support they get and whether their needs are being met. So I, I don't know if that's something for a workshop agenda. Maybe we'll hear more from them uh, at the end of our meeting. But um, you know, I think maybe there's a there might be a better ways that we can provide support um, because the work they do in the natural area is very valuable. If they were not there, perhaps we would not enjoy the beauty of the natural area as it is. Uh, potentially, we might have to pay more money to keep it because there's a lot of hundreds of volunteers hours being placed in every every year. Um, so I just wanted to to at least open that as a you know something to that I'd like to follow up with you mayor maybe and Teresa and to the others in the council, whether it's through the workshop agenda or wherever it would be best. But I think that I know that we have too many commissions and too many, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of needs, but I think in this particular case, we also need to think when we are thinking about who we provide support to, we need to think about alignment of efforts and hours, number of hours spent on projects, uh, you know, and, and, and provide uh, those who are really putting in the hundreds of hours maybe uh, some more support. That would be uh, something I want to mention. Thank you. Uh, personnel and Parks and Recreation, Councilwoman Hope. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll see in personnel, there are uh, the names of the folks that we have hired to be counselors this summer for the Reading Crew. Um, and I know we'll have some other personnel things to discuss in the executive agenda. Um, for, for Parks and Rec, 
Uh, for Parks and Rec, we have, um, so we, have a, we have been looking for a head counselor for the older kids. And uh, we have one candidate we're really excited about, um, hoping that comes through. If not, we have some other applicants that we can look through. Um, we are looking to add potentially more regular counselors to reflect the number of participants. We had enrollment last year of about 200. We're looking at probably 220 to 225 this year. Um, AEDs, just for reference, in case you get questions, have been ordered. They should be delivered at the end of this month. Um, Fairhaven 4 uh, Precision should be on site this Wednesday to start uh, addressing the field upgrades. Um, and just as an FYI for the playgrounds, we did uh, remulch the playground today at McCarter Park. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Hoey. Uh, moving along to Police, Fire, and Office of Emergency Management, Councilman Rodriguez. Sure. Um, from Fire, um, just real quick, I gave all the stats um, leading up through this month, which is not yet complete in the last meeting. Uh, but one thing that um, they did suggest uh, as a good way to uh, improve relations uh, with the community and uh, and foster relations with the council and the mayor, um, they wanted to offer their location for a council meeting um, in the future. Um, doesn't have to happen right away, but it'll help people understand um, what they do and, and just go inside and be in and around the police department. I'm sorry, the fire department, other than going to the fair. Um, they have a nice room. You've been there, you've sworn some folks in there in the past. So um, maybe they could give their update um, when we're in their confines if we decide to do that. No obligation. It's an offer, um, I think, worth taking up uh, with them. The upstairs room. Okay. Just, yep. Definitely a consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, from the police, um, we've got um, a class one and a class two on our uh, consent agenda, which um, you know are much needed, and uh, we all know about how the um, how difficult it is to find good hires. So. Um, I'm endorsing that. So um, turn back. And also, uh, someone in this room in the way back is going to celebrate his 48th birthday, Chief McGovern, this week. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I must have gotten that wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving along, uh, we already did facilities, engineering, DPW, Councilman Long Barbera. Yep. Um, she had a few different things. Um, real quick on Cambridge Avenue. So, we're going to be looking to have an open house with the Cambridge residents in June to talk through the potential stop sign and parking signs that we're going to put there. Um, and we'll likely be having a meeting with the Little Silver Council representative um, again. just keep fostering that and making sure we stay on top of that. I'm gonna hit zoning boards first and then uh, I'll come back to uh, engineering DPW. Zoning board next meeting is 01 June. Um, from an engineering DPW, um, related to brush and leaf committee, uh, Rich was there this past uh, 18 May. The whole goal was to align practicality with the creative solutions that were ginned up, specific communication, uh, enforcement, and then actual pickup. Uh, had a phenomenal education on vegetative waste. That's why I asked it, um, because it's actually not clearly spelled out how we handle that in our town. Um, so next meeting is 15 June. I want to come up with one to two solutions to recommend implementing and present that to the government body. Um, we're targeting September. It's a soft swag date. We just wanted the date and sand that we want to hold ourselves accountable to. So we'll come with solutions. Uh, we hit the grant submission. Uh, Hanson Cooney, um, paving's on hold until the Verizon poll is figured out. Um, we're working with Rich Verizon, who's also working at JCPNL. Long story short, polls got to get moved so that we don't do an incomplete job. Uh, project prioritization, um, we're going to be putting that updated uh, prioritization together after the last feedback. Um, we're looking at engineering, DBW, recreation. We're working on five-year capital plan, vehicle plan, maintenance plan, engine plan. And then we also have a Gantt chart 
think of it as a virtual whiteboard tracking all the projects. The other item for engineering DPW is brush grind. Uh, it started today. Fair. Did it start today? Uh, no, it starts tomorrow. They they put it today. Okay, brush grinding starting tomorrow. Uh, it's coming tomorrow. Yep. Um, and that is everything that I have. Um, may I ask you to pick up after you, Johnson and Mel Barbera. Um, outreach and communication will continue to focus on construction notices. And we're teed up and ready to go on Hanson Cooney whenever we get the green light. So from a communication standpoint, hope we'll have a slightly more timely notification for the neighborhood. Um, um, I wanted to touch on the fact that I heard excellent outreach on the DPW open houses. Um, I'm happy that work is continuing to be such an important part of our facilities work. Um, we are also coordinating outreach and communications, coordinating with engineering DPW, the Gantt chart that, um, that you met, just mentioned will help give us sort of the horizon line of construction and projects that are in the pipeline and on the horizon. And hopefully that can give us um, a longer view for communications so that we're ready when it's time to communicate something about impacting traffic and or um, daily life in Fairview. Let's see, the Environmental Commission will be contemplating its next round table, stay tuned. Um, the green team I wanted to mention had um, their heart set on a pollinator slash green garden Although the grant didn't come through, there's still um, some hope that, that some of that project will advance more to come. The Shade Tree Commission is looking at a resident tree buying program. I wanted to mention it here. It wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't launch until the fall. And we're still working through the process and sort of what needs to be put in place in order for that to be as seamless and successful as we'd like it to be. Um, the idea is that by the fall, vendors or nurseries who have inventory are more motivated to sell a better price and sort of bulk purchases and anyone in fair even who would like to plant a tree but maybe doesn't have the time doesn't know what to choose doesn't, but is willing to write the check stake locate the stake uh, or the tree where it would be planted this is one call one check and um, the vendor would come and install the tree so you'd obviously own the tree, water it, and take care of it. But we're looking at the steps that are necessary to put the resident tree buying program in place. Um, obviously, the Shade Tree Commission is, they would want me to say, they're pleased that there's a draft of the uh, tree preservation ordinance and look forward to hearing more about that, which I will report to them on our behalf. Um, the Family and Business Association is hosting a summer barbecue the first Wednesday in June. Um, the Ferguson's, it's a wonderful annual tradition, and I'm sure that they would extend that invitation to the governing body and, of course, every local business person in Fairhaven. Um, I, I can touch on the, our first grant committee meeting. Um, uh, Councilman Ho, Councilwoman Hoey and I are liaison with the Mayor's Grant Committee. We had our first meeting on May 1st. It's a terrific group of people. Um, five folks volunteered. They all have different, but um, applicable backgrounds. Um, I think we're going to leverage each other's unique abilities very nicely. Uh, we've already begun to sort of identify grants that are out there and we're cataloging them and coming up with ways to review, provide um, kind of a, a summary, really brief executive level summary that would then come back to this body for your consideration. Um, we had a productive um, call with Cologne's office, uh, not specific to the appropriation related to the community center where they hope, you know, the appropriation that we hope is coming, but just more broadly about how their office can support Fairhaven as we look at what grants um, are available. So that went very well. I'm going to continue to do that kind of outreach and let you know how it goes. Thank you, Tim. Mr. Mayor. Just one anecdote, just because I know we talked rain garden. There is one being put at the police department. Yeah. So if you guys want to see it or anything, um, we are doing that. And it was Rich's idea. So. Yes. Yeah. Or I can wait. Actually, no, it's on the agenda. I'll wait. Are you sure? Yeah. 
Okay. All right. Mr. Mayor, before we move on, I just want to note that I got the squeaky chair today, and I want to know who actually gave me the squeaky chair. Oh, I think the it was on, I know it's on purpose. I'm just saying, my chair is so squeaky. <laughs> it was on the outside. It's just a matter of time. It's going to get to each other. We're not fixing it just for the fun of it. It's part of, it's part of the open house operation. You know? <laughs> All right, we have consent agenda resolutions 2023-142 through 2023-153. Before I ask if there's a motion, does anyone want to separate anything out of the consent agenda? Um, not separate, but I just wanted to ask question? to abstain from 2023-146. She doesn't believe in camps. <laughs> uh, does anyone have anything, any other questions on anything in the consent agenda? No? Uh, does anyone have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve consent agenda. Second. Allison, may I please have a roll call? Councilmember's call? Yes. Cohen? Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, Department reports 2021 annual report from the Board of Adjustment, April 2023. Uh, this is what I wanted to speak to briefly, if I could. Sure. So every year the Zoning Board um, prepares an annual report. It's a lot of work. Um, and I'm always grateful for it. I think sometimes there's a gap in the reports. This not meaning that sometimes it takes a year to actually get it out. So you're getting a couple of years in review at one time. But I uh, just want to acknowledge the zoning board. That board works really hard. Um, and I think they, they, they examine a disproportionate number of applications um, that, that's unique to Fairhaven. Typically, planning board would see more applications and your zoning board is where you're looking for relief. You know, a lot of the things that residents in Fairhaven want, whether it's because our ordinance are Byzantine and it's complex, or if it's simply because we have a lot of quirky conditions um, or it's market forces and what people are looking for in their homes. But a lot of applications end up at the zoning board and um, they do a, a really good job. It's not an easy. Uh, it's not easy. So I just wanted to offer that. But so when they make recommendations, I think we should look at that. Um, and there are a couple recommendations. The, the report is a it's data, right? Every year we get data so we can understand, you know, what what their what their undertaking is like for the year. And as I said, I think they're a pretty busy zoning board compared to a lot of other communities. Um, one of the things that they, a few of the things that they've asked for really are repeat findings. These are things that they have recommended in past annual reports and continue to do so. So um, I'll just highlight them. Enforcement, which is, I think, a drum that continues to get beat for a reason. And I don't know when we'll have, the, when the right moment for us as a governing body to examine the role of enforcement in Fairhaven um, is, but I want to highlight that it has been a continual uh, part of the zoning board's annual report in the form of a recommendation, specifically requirement of as built surveys to ensure code compliance, including setback requirement, zoning board variance, resolution compliance, and general consistency between what was permitted and what was actually built. So we have, all of us have probably heard at least a handful of stories, it seems like what's built is not actually what was approved. Um, they have a note in here about clarification about riparian areas, and I can understand why that's confusing for them because they don't know where the lot ends if it's, if it's riparian, um, and therefore that would impact the, the lot size. Um, I'm sure that that could be addressed by the engineer, but there still seems to be some remaining confusion around that. Um, and I won't go into each one, but the other one that I wanted to highlight was a request for workshop. And workshops to me, and I, I don't know exactly what, I think there's two. They're asking for workshops in that people come to the zoning board kind of with a little bit of an expectation that they're gonna be approved when 
they don't understand that when you come before the zoning board, you're asking for relief, meaning you don't want the rules to apply to you. And, uh, and you know, the approval is not automatic. But the other reason you might, they might be talking about workshops for an informal review. I don't know that they'll have time for that or if that's exactly what they're getting at. Do you want to address that? Yeah, so um, I was intimately involved with this annual report. Um, nice job. And if you look at the observations, right, it, it's worth taking a minute. One, I, I want to dispel a myth that, you know, the zoning board is approving all these applications to build these units, right? In 2021, it was 0.2% of residents had approval to, to provide enough um, justification to seek relief. But if you look at this, majority of application, and, and also what was done here was there was an analysis done from 2016 to 2021. So the 2021 annual report didn't only just look at 2021, it tried to identify trends in the data to help inform what we should do to better handle it, right? And so 31% were approved with revisions, 28% approved as presented, and 21% were carried to the next year. Majority of the applications between that five-year period was either an addition, 48%, porch patio or driveway, 21.8%, or new construction. And the majority of the zones approved were some R10 combination, 10, 10, 8, 10, 8, over half, or R5. So the goal was to try, as, as, you, as you talk to residents on the zoning board, the zoning board process is extremely, it costs a tremendous amount of money. Mm -hmm. It takes a tremendous amount of time. And if there was some type of workshop where, where residents could educate and maybe um, have that initial volley back and forth, informal volley, it, it might improve the process, make it less financially burdened, and just facilitate a more effective zoning board. Now, the reason that it was talked about was, was because there are some residents who do that already. Mm -hmm. So when I was on the zoning board, there were some residents, and it's very, very clear, they're talking to the, 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 the zoning board engineer, the, the planner, right? They're going back and forth with the variations or making changes to the drawing. So it really comes back to workshop, communication, setting up some type of mechanism. I have no idea what that looks like um, to do that. The other piece here that I want to highlight, that riparian, that's on the list in the summer to address. Okay. And that's what I mentioned. I forget what we were talking about. Was that today? The riparian and the DEP rules. I think we were talking about that earlier in stormwater management where mm -hmm. the state guidance is misaligned with an ordinance that we passed that was not very past like 15 years ago. So um, it's really eye-opening, especially to, to see the trends over the last five years. So, so just quickly, and then, I'll, and then, then I'm glad we took a minute on this, and that's all I wanted to do personally. But um, question, Teresa, or, or perhaps uh, Mr. Sobel, does the zoning board have the authority to accommodate a 15-minute informal review, or is that a mechanism that we would need to add to language that form the zoning board and its powers? Well, I don't call the NLUL laws. It's really a legal question we have to ask the attorney okay. for the land use board. But, but I'm going to say 100%, a lot of the volley you're talking about or the input you're talking about are um, zoning office between Nick Brzezinski and Joan Mueller spent an awful lot of time one-on-one -on -one with residents mm -hmm. trying to work with them on their zoning application if there's a way, shape, or form to alleviate them going to the board, they do work with them one-on-one. -on -one I know that. that. And it says in here, even with that, that there are instances where applications are coming to the board not fully complete, which is an important yeah. step. The applications are deemed complete before they get even on the schedule. And there are instances- so that's, that's done by your app. That's, that's by your that's not by our office. Then, nevertheless, I mean, if I'm advocating for the volunteers that are serving in the zoning board, which is a big part of what I'm doing here right now, I'd like the mechanisms to work better so that they're getting comfortable. I don't disagree with them. They, yeah. they appoint their professionals. If they're not happy with the service of their professionals, they need to bring that up to the professionals. They're autonomous. They don't, they, I have no, no yes. input put on that. Yes, I, I understand that. the board and their professionals. And if, if they're getting applications that their professionals need to complete, it's problematic. They need to put that up to the professionals. 
It sounds like it is. Yeah. And I've certainly seen it. It makes the volunteers to work a lot harder. Um, so, so then I have seen land use boards do informal reviews. Would that only be at the planning board? I think it's a plan board level, but it's really a good question. Okay. Well, not to speak through, but I think it also means how we define informal mm -hmm. review, right? If yeah, we're going through the that, inner workings of an application, that probably I can certainly good. ask Doug. Yeah. Um, you know, but as Teresa stated, I mean, completely autonomous to what we do as far as, you know, their informal, you know, what their regulations provide for mm -hmm. the municipal land use law. I don't believe there is. I, I sat on the planning board for a few years. Um, I don't believe there is a mechanism to have that informal review. At a zoning board. It, zoning and I don't believe even that. It could look though, it could look like Nick and Joe having a 45 minute workshop on you know planning and zoning one on one. I'm not saying we're gonna sign them up for that, but it comes down to how we define informal, right? If we're talking in hypotheticals and educated on the process, that's fine, as opposed to going into your application and wonder if it's uh, mm -hmm. test complete as an accuracy of it, right? So I think that's the intent. I don't want to get into the notes. That, yeah. That's more of the professionals working with the other, you know, the engineering professionals to make sure that when these applications are being submitted and they are, you know, put on to a, a hearing date that they are mm -hmm. complete and there isn't a waste of the time for the both the you know the municipality, us the volunteers and the professionals, as well yeah. as the applicant themselves, yeah. because the applicant is paying for attorneys. Yeah. Uh, they're you know they're taking their time out to sit at one of these uh, land use boards. Yeah. yeah. And then you have an the land use board had one of those. Yeah, it was very complicated. I a, heard a couple so many of years ago able to attend. And but, you know, you, you look at. 10 applications last year. I mean, if, if you want us to, you know, have Nick and Joe do a, a video that you're going to post on the website, what's the process of, of going through the next yeah. board? We certainly could do it at some point yeah. in the future, but, you know, you're talking a town of 6,000 residents, 2,200 homes, and you get 10 applications a year, thinking you need to, to set up an entire process for those 10 applications a year, that, you know, an open house or something like that doesn't, doesn't to me, make sense. But, Having something that says these are the steps you need yeah. to go through is not an e learning video. video. That's a nice idea. Yeah. Complicated. I'll uh, I'll work with the with the zoning board as once a I'm sure the zoning board chair could do one if you so desire. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, sure. It's a great report though. Take a look at it. It's five years of data crammed into four pages. So <laughs> nice job. Thank you. Uh, April 2023. Reports, tax collector, muni court, police department, planning board, zoning board. I have a motion to accept as submitted. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Thank you. We are at the good of the borough portion of our uh, meeting. Please stand and identify yourself by clearly stating your name and address for the record. Please try to observe a time limit of three minutes. Mr. Olson. Olson, from Cambridge Avenue. Uh, just one report on. What's going on on the Third Street Trail? You guys approved us on, I guess it was March 27th. We planted for the Arbor Day. We planted 18 more. We got them all done. They're all in. They look great. Um, also on Third Street, west of Third Street, if you can think of how Third Street Trail goes, in the parking lot, very much feels got blessed. On the western side, it's just wide open, and our, we haven't gone in there. It's uh, it's a mess of invasives. We have uh, some dead ash trees that have been there for a couple of years. They're dead. We have some Atlantis trees, some large Atlantis trees. We have some Norway maples, large Norway maples. We have some fallen trees that are kind of a risk if you ever want to go in there and clean out the invasives. We have the three main invasives. We have the multi-floor rose, the oriental, oriental bittersweet, and the porcelain berry. But going in there, we, we really need to get those trees taken out of there. Uh, Kevin Slavin, he did a big project for us over in the northwest corner of the natural area. I've had him in there a couple of times. He'd like to help us out and he would uh, help us remove some of those trees for a couple thousand dollars. Spoke to administrator uh, today, Teresa, and 
I think we can, I can raise some money and we can pay for that. And we'd love to have them come in and clear that out on our nickel, on the residence nickel. Mm -hmm. But we need to speak to you. I think you're doing such an amazing thing out there. It's, it's completely transformed already. Even saw the mayor walking through there the other day. <laughs> the mayor always walks through there. Yeah. I've told you many times how, how beautiful that area yeah. is. Yeah. It does. I, you know, if, if once again, I know this came up originally, but if you guys are funding it and paying, you know, normal market value, as long as we have the resources to help, you know, when when you need the help, I'm I'm not objecting to it. I don't mind. I'll, be good. I'll help support. I just want to do a project intake, follow the process, yeah. qualify the scope, sure. get it to Teresa, and I'll help you turn around really quickly. But, but he is, uh, he can help us out on the 12th and 13th of June, and then his window closes for the okay. rest of the summer. So we'd really like to get it on either one of those days. We would need some DPW help to close the trail. I don't think anyone should be in there when he's going there with his equipment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the removal that we would bring into brush grinding is de minimis. I said, you know, Kevin, why don't we just say one or two loads? Things like Mark, I don't even think it's going to be one or two loads. It's not nearly as big as what we did over there in the Northwest. There's not as much down trees. And we'd like to keep some of the trees down and just cut them up into smaller pieces and work with them like some of the well, like we did with a couple of the other trees. What's what's the uh, the plan for um, the brush grinding site with the product that's being cut down? So it's it's cut down. Yeah, but the, the thing is, it's going to be empty. The brush grinding site for um, Fairhaven Day, so we really don't want anything delivered there. This would be two days after. That's right. It's the twelfth, so that's the twelfth. The day after. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to do the intake with them, outline everything, submit it to Teresa. She turned the button on meets the requirements. It sounds like minimal support from DPW, no funding to the borough. I mean, the intake and, process is terrific because it'll actually, this is a, an opportunity to really use that tool, which is yeah. nice. Like, I don't, I don't think it's going to interfere with the intention and the idea as you presented it, but it does give us an opportunity to use yep. the, the tool as we just need the we need the William Street Trail closed up. We need the whole thing closed off. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We'll scope it out the You can do that caution tape. It's yeah. not yeah. complicated. Mm -hmm. We can start some more. Right. So are you guys gonna yeah I'll start if you guys are cool, I'll circle up, get it to research. Right. She just has to cut a PO, but it'll be fully funded, right? Uh, yeah, wait, wait. our next meeting is on the 12th. You don't need any other approval on that. Okay. Just that we can do the intake process and, and I will not cut a purchase order until I have the um the donation and how do you want the vehicle where do you want the donation to go to uh you would borrow mm -hmm. fair even number deposit and change your trust and pay it out of that same trust okay all right perfect great thank you mark thank you thank you. Thank, you. thank you anyone else in the public they yep. michael b sally member of respectful river road you mentioned workshopping with cambridge would that be something that maybe could be done with like Colonial Court River Road about the flooding? Have you ever considered doing a workshop? Just because we're the ones who've been living in it, we really, I've watched all mm -hmm. like what's happening. Maybe that would be a good idea to have everyone together so we're all on the same page about what's really happening from the different perspective of all the different houses. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Especially with anyone else in the public? Yeah. I have one item. Oh. Do you want to go before them or? <laughs> Allison, is there anyone? Yeah. Go ahead. I wanted to ask that something else that came up uh, in the um, this uh, the committee uh, the, uh, meeting with the National Area Committee. What is the process that the borough has for encroachments into the natural area? There's at least one case on Fahaven Road that uh, there's a significant encroachment so on the backyard. Fence, like a fence? No. You mean a private property that has encroached in the public? Yep. Or significantly encroached. Just meaning like grass that started. Yep. I will tell you, probably and, and going back three years now, maybe a little bit more, the yeah. borough uh, yeah. undertook um, putting up markers all around Fairhaven Fields property, the mm -hmm. cooperation of Green Acres who had done an inspection. And uh, we identified all the properties that were encroaching uh, into the park and had people remove pieces. I will say over time, <laughs> those 
markers, which were clearly delineating borough property, have been disappearing, <laughs> disappearing in, the, in a great way. Um, and some of the encroachments may have creeped back in. Um, it's, a, it's a project. And like I said, we undertook it, like Rich said, probably three to five mm -hmm. years ago. And, and Green Acres helped, and we sent letters, and it's, it's a big deal. I, if I may, but if it's one particular property, and we don't have to redo the entire thing again, um, I'm not could... sure. I mean, there is definitely one particular property, and it's significant. Mm -hmm. But there are other properties that's my understanding that may be um, planting trees or evergreen trees, so that they get maybe a buffer. You know, from the like, so if you are in your backyard, instead of looking at the natural area, which will not be really protected, maybe you put some nice bushes and evergreens. Uh, so that you have more of a buffer. However, if you're going to do that, you need to do that in your backyard. You should not be doing that in the natural area. Mm -hmm. It is my view that if the DPW, someone from the DPW sees that, and I, I think there might be some knowledge of that, um, they should go there and give notice and mow it down or do whatever <laughs> it takes. Essentially, if you put it in the natural area, yeah. it's going to be removed. I mean, but, but I, I guess I'm just asking, like, what is the procedure? Because I really feel that you know, if we it. don't do anything about it, that it empowers uh, you know, more of that behavior. Unless, unless someone's no, notified the borough, it's a, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. So if, if you know the specific property, I would share that information and we can look into it. And is then we address it just like know, if someone was encroaching on my property. Our it's the property. doesn't, you know, they, don't, they don't have right. quarter it's markers, right. surveys. They don't have the expertise to say that that tree's in the natural area versus that somebody's backyard. So if they, if you think there's, you know, a question, we certainly could, you know, ask for a copy of their survey and have code enforcement or someone look into it. But, you know, it's as, as, a, as a larger project, it is a larger project. If you're talking about one or two properties, and we want to look at an individual basis, it's probably a little more doable. There's one particular case we should take care of immediately, but I think that in, I don't have the knowledge to know how widespread the problem is. Um, I, you know, I suspect uh, maybe in terms of knowledge, uh, it might reside with people from the PW or uh, the Natural Rights Committee who are always walking around there, but beyond that, maybe we should every few years go back and resurvey those properties because as you said, those markers are disappearing and lawns are you know creeping out and it's, a, it's, right it's another kind of, it's another it's project an and another cost annual, annual uh, surveillance mm -hmm. project. It's it's a tough one because it sounds like there's some considerable cost involved here with with doing so. Um, we hired an outside consulting firm and surveyors and you know and, and I agree with you. I mean it's our it's borough property, it shouldn't be taken. I, I know that a, someone had mentioned there was a fence put in next to McCarter Pond recently, and immediately we checked to make sure it wasn't it wasn't encroaching on borough property. So yeah, I agree with you hundred percent that shouldn't happen. As far as us just kind of going out to look for it, uh, I don't know about that. I I, I think it's gotta be more like Hey, I know there's a problem here at 38 Farragut Road. I'm just throwing out a number. And at that point, we, we actually address it through code enforcement. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, they have to be. Because otherwise, I mean, we could do that with anything. You could say, oh, you know, these kids, these kids are doing drugs in their house. I know they're doing drugs. But, I mean, it becomes a, you know, you're throwing darts at, at a wall at a certain point. So, who, who should people go to, Teresa? <laughs> I mean, of course, where, 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 <laughs> where, 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 let's call it what it is, but at the end of the day, <laughs> if you want to say to me that X, Y is the one, two, three, X road is encroaching into the natural area and it's a single property, or I'll certainly, you know, send someone over there to take a look at it, but I don't necessarily have their survey. So, you know, I can certainly, you know, and we don't, you know. And I, I, and I would just like to qualify, right? And, and I'm in full agreement, potential encroachment until proven, right? Like, I'm coming, I'm looking at you, right? We, like, so well, I mean, hey, yeah, we, we, we have to be certain when Correct. we issue notice of violation. I want to be like really careful on this line of refresh. Let's be refresh. clear that the borough spent eight years in litigation over encroachment and a riparian grant that was <laughs> painfully obvious. So, you know, encroachment is not as simple as you think, but I'll be, right. you know, sometimes just a simple letter saying, hey, we know you're, you're encroaching. Get your survey out because they know. Go to your corner mark. Of course they do. Yeah, but I mean, Go to your corner markers. I mean, if, if we don't reclaim that 
At one point, at one point, do we lose that? Yeah, of course, yeah. that's twenty yeah. years. Yeah. Of right. so, yeah, I mean, I just want to make you know it's an ongoing thing. But thank you. Just as long as we open the door, me. Can, can I just point out what he said though? Seriously, he said twenty years. Do we know the last time we did it? Yeah, five, five years ago. Well, we did the berm by the baseball fields on Fair Haven Fields Maybe. on the on the west side. That's what we, we could did. we could argue though. I mean, not to you know legal on that one. But I mean, we could argue that we didn't. Have, it was a new encroachment, right? They removed it, and then it's a new encroachment. And so I'm not so worried about the twenty yeah. years, but what I am worried about is us issuing any sort of letter. Whether it's being letterhead or borough letterhead without being certain, I would I would assume that the DPW has a survey in the natural area. We do. The borough does, but yeah. Burrow, okay. Okay. We did a complete outback. Well, okay. But lawn areas and trees are not always picked up on that survey. Physical features are. Right. Fences, structures. Well, we, could, we could do the complete out. We could take the complete outbound and pay somebody to go out and put the size up again. But how many sides do you think are left from what we did that project? If you were guessing person. We did we mark every other property corner, so at least you grabs it, and then you could do a straight line assessment. But the great majority of them have been removed. And somewhat disposed of in some manner. Shape there any, maybe we need a borough permanent fence on our property line. But do we, do we need to keep talking about this well, right now? No, I just wanted to raise awareness to that sure. because I think there it is an issue and it's a little unclear where to go. And it sounds like we go to Teresa. Um, well, and there's one particular case I think we need to get to that. I, I bring that one up. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. On that. I'm assuming we're Allison, we're clear there? No. Mrs. Please, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, Ruth? I just have a suggestion, and it was sort of what the attorney said about this problem. At the time that Green Acres did this marking off, they must have put property lines and measurements, and they must have given the borough a copy. With that in hand, why cannot somebody from DPW go out and walk the property and see that it is indeed within the measurements? That sounds pretty simple to me. Green Acres didn't do it, the borough did it. Yeah. Well, so we, you know, it would take someone that had some time and expertise to go out and review those signs. You don't have a map of it. You didn't get square footage. It's, it's not as simple as you're you're you're, no. you're playing it down to be. Ruth, we we appreciate it, and and we're gonna follow up and see what we can come up with. Thank you. Uh, we're good, Allison. Okay, uh, we are going to move to executive session. It is ten forty three p.m. No formal action will be taken. Uh, do I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Okay, uh, we're going to close out tonight's meeting. We're going to close out tonight's meeting at 11:06 p.m. Do I have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Good night, Fairhaven. <laughs> Good night, Fairhaven. <laughs>